When I was a little girl, I lived in an apartment complex with my mother. The entire complex consists of two buildings that sat side by side, less than 100 feet apart, with four two-bedroom flats upstairs and two downstairs. We lived downhill about 100 yards from a major five-lane road, but you were never known due to the thick woods that bordered the complex on three sides. The last side was an area cut for power lines that ran next to our driveway, with a graveyard directly behind it. It should go without saying that this setup was a recipe for many childish shenanigans as well as creepy encounters. On the front side of the complex and along the power line side were thick blackberry brambles. They weren't quite as thick along the power line area, but in front of the apartment you couldn't stick your arm in without being torn apart by the thorns, and it was so thick that it was nearly impossible to push through. This is relevant later. I was the only young child that lived there full time, and all the neighbors were, to the best of my knowledge, fond of me. I was active in Girl Scouts, and so when it was time to go around to all the neighbors for orders, then when they came in, I would get my little wagon and deliver them, because my mother knew and trusted all of the neighbors, and I would do this myself. The day this happened, I had taken my wagon to the other building to deliver cookies to some of my mother's friends and was walking back. I hadn't meant to stay as long as I did, but they had an aquarium that was fascinating to me. That day, my mother's friend's husband had bought some new fish so I had spent about 45 minutes helping them pick out names. So when I began to walk back, dusk had fallen. I had walked about seven steps off their porch when I got a bad feeling. Now, I understand that I'm an empath, and I have learned to listen to my intuition, but back then, I just thought that I had to poo, bad. I stopped for a second to settle my stomach and I heard a noise. When I looked to the front of the apartment, where the blackberries were the most thick, initially, I couldn't see anything and I wanted to say he had flicked a lighter or something almost like he was trying to purposely alert me of his presence. The second that I saw him, I froze. He had shoulder length, stringy black hair, bad skin and looked like a skeleton he was so skinny. Knowing what I know now, I imagine that he was probably strung out. I realized when he knew that I saw him because his face split into a wicked, not at all friendly grin. Then he began tearing his way through the blackberry brambles towards me. I began running towards my house while screaming bloody murder as I heard his feet slap the pavement behind me. I got to my steps and my uncle Mike who lived next door flung his door open to see what the heck was going on, but the man had disappeared. I began screaming and crying about the man that had chased me out of the woods because Mike hadn't seen him. Initially he had thought that I'd let my imagination run away with me. But when he looked at the area I said that he had emerged from, there was a clear path and blood from where he had been cut by the thorns. After they took their machete to cut away the brambles and investigate where he had came from, they discovered a small area he had been standing in, with a small pile of cigarette butts like he had stood there waiting for me when he saw me walk across initially. A few weeks later, deeper in the woods, my mother's boyfriend and I discovered a small tent with assorted, unappropriate paraphernalia. No one mentioned the connection, but I was very mature for my age, so when I thought about it, it disturbed me very much. So, disturbing stranger that departed your tent to watch me from the woods, let's not meet again. I'm a university student now, but this incident happened when I was in 8th grade. When I was around 14, I studied a subject focusing on outdoor pursuits. For our final assessment, two teachers took my class on a one night camp where we would do activities like rock climbing, kayaking, trail walking, and so on. I live in Australia, around an hour from a state forest that was notorious for the backpacker murders. Several bodies had been found and several more remained missing. 
and I'm pretty sure all of the murders were linked to the same killer. Anyway, in the morning, we leave the school and drive out in a bus. When we reach the road that leads to the entrance of the forest, a police car is parked outside. He spoke to the teacher for a moment, but I didn't hear anything and no one else seemed to notice or care. Fast forward a few hours and we've tracked about 20 of us to the camping area somewhere in the middle of a state forest. Some parts are a state and some parts are privately owned, I think. While kayaking that afternoon, we noticed a helicopter doing flybys, but again, my classmates never suspected anything. A couple of mates and I were the first to leave the water and tell the teacher with some equipment and started building our own rafts. I was standing off to the side when one of the national park guides walked over to one of the instructors and talked in a hushed, slightly stressed out tone. I remember hearing the instructor say stuff like, you're kidding and I don't believe it. He just looked shocked and taken aback. So at this point, I started connecting the dots but I didn't say anything to my school friends. Around dusk that night, I got to use the toilet block which is around 100 meters from the main campsite. As I go in, I remember a guy walking around the other side of the block. I didn't see him very clearly in the diminished light, but he kept glancing around with nervous body language. I couldn't see his face clearly. He wasn't part of our party, and to me he just didn't fit. I didn't think much of it at the time though. Fast forward to the next morning when we got back to the car park. The teacher tells us that a body was found in a dam not far from where we were. They didn't want to tell us so as to not frighten us. We later found out that it was a young guy who was killed with an axe. And the guy who did it was related to the serial killer who hunted in the same area. I don't know if that guy I saw had anything at all to do with the murders. But it freaked me out a lot afterwards. I haven't been camping since. This happened to me when I was 17, around the time when most of my friends were just getting their driver's license. We all had that rush for cars back then, so it was quite common for us to skip school and go for a ride out of town. The city where I live is surrounded by forests and two mountains, so we basically had a lot of places to go and chill. One day, my friend was very excited to show us a place that he had found about online, and possibly here on Reddit, for which people said was quite odd. We looked it up and apparently, it had a reputation for being a paranormal site. Being the typical group of teens, we collectively agreed to check it out ASAP, including me who more or less believes in spiritual stuff. Going up the mountain, we were listening to the radio until we lost the station to static, which for obvious reasons is what the radio does when you go deep into the woods. This entire experience is happening during a summer night, so we were feeling pretty careless and as excited as a person can be. Having no music to listen to, we started talking and discussing our expectations for this place, with most of us having no expectations at all. Our conversation was suddenly interrupted by the loud static coming from the radio that we had just turned off a few minutes ago. We were all a bit startled, but still, nothing out of the ordinary. It happened again a few minutes later. We all looked at the radio, and it was still off. We quickly dismissed this as something that radios do for some reason, and again, didn't pay much attention. The third time that it happened, the driver hit the brakes and stopped the car. He turned to us and yelled, Come on, did you hear that? What was that? Claiming that, he heard a voice this time. None of us heard anything except the static. The driver said that he had had enough and switched the engine off, so there is no possible way for anything including the radio to be working. We all sat there like that for a while in pitch black, for there would be no city lights around us and the forest had covered all other light sources like stars and so on. You can distinguish a night sky. That's how dark it was. The light indicating the radio turned down and soon, the static came again. I could tell that we were all feeling a bit anxious by then. 
Through the static came a female voice singing, and it was very silent. For a second, it got louder and then fell back to silent again, and then vanished. But even weirder, the static vanished too. Once we switched the car back on and turned the headlights on too, we observed what seemed to be smudges of fingers all across the windshield. We didn't turn the car around immediately, but I could tell that we all just wanted to leave. We stopped further up on the hill, took some pictures of the Milky Way, and went home afterward. Ever since we speculate about what the heck happened to the radio and the windshield that night, my friends went two more times without me to the same place, recording the same including feeling a small push once and the car was off. What do you guys think? I believe there are many logical explanations, but considering the fact that I'm somewhat of a person who believes in such stuff, and I had an adrenaline rush that night, it's hard for me to grasp something rational. I was 18 at the time. One evening, me and my two friends, Mike and Paul, decided to go camping. Well, camping maybe isn't the right word, since we didn't intend to spend the night only to chill and have some fun around the campfire for a while. The plan was simple. Head out, build a campfire, drink a few bottles of wine, eat something, and head back home for a good night's sleep. We met at my house when it was still sunny outside. We got ready and we headed out. Our destination was an old abandoned quarry in the middle of the woods, which was maybe 40 minutes away from my house. Even though the quarry has a tragic and frankly creepy history, it's a popular place for such occasions. When we got there, the sky was already colored red as the sun slowly sank behind the hills. We quickly gathered all the firewood that we could, so we wouldn't have to look for it later. As the darkness fell and absorbed all of our surroundings into impenetrable blackness, we had already managed to get the fire going. We were in a great mood and we were getting ready for our first toast. And that's when we realized that we had made a horrible mistake. We forgot the corkscrew. We were trying to open the wine without it, but we quickly gave up. Because the bottles were quite expensive and we didn't want to damage them. At this point, it was clear that one of us would have to sacrifice themselves and jog back to retrieve the corkscrew. After a bit of haggling, I volunteered. However, I had two conditions. Firstly, they would give me a hatchet in case something went wrong along the way. And secondly, no pranks when I got back. Mike and Paul agreed without hesitation. They shoved a hatchet into my one hand and a flashlight to the other, and sent me on my way. As I was jogging through the forest, I heard a noise resembling a wild boar. Suddenly, I remembered a warning I received from an older hunter a few days ago. He said that this time of a year, boars were getting dangerous, especially at night. I was a bit nervous, but luckily, I managed to survive with no harm. I arrived safely to my house, much to my surprise of my mom who didn't expect me back so early. I explained the whole deal, which she just laughed. I grabbed the corkscrew and was back on my way. I wanted to experience an unpleasant boar encounter. I chose another, slightly longer path, this time through an open field. After a while, I got to our spot. It was a small clearing, surrounded on one side by massive rocks, maybe 70 meters tall, and on the other side by thick forest. Somewhere in the middle of the clearing was our campfire. When I approached it, I realized that there wasn't anybody, although our backpacks were still on the ground and the fire was burning bright. Great. We specifically agreed that there would be no pranks when I got back. Those guys think that they're funny, I thought to myself. I resignedly sat down near the fire while facing the woods. That's the only place where those two guys could have hidden, I thought. I was really tired and all I could think about was the taste of that exquisite Pinot Noir we had brought with us. I really wasn't in the mood for their games and I was getting quite mad. And that's when I heard a snapping of twigs and rustling of leaves from the edge of the forest, maybe 30 meters from where I was sitting. 
The sound was rhythmical and it was undoubtedly the sound of somebody walking. I aimed my flashlight to the spot where sounds were coming from. Between the trees, I spotted a tall person wearing a dark hoodie. As I shined my flashlight on him, he stopped walking, turned to me and just kept staring motionlessly. Even though he was directly facing me, I couldn't really see his face. I shouted, Paul, you fatso. I know you're trying to scare me. We agreed on something, so stop messing around and come out. As I finished, the hooded figure had just turned around and walked deeper into the woods. Exactly at that time, my phone started ringing. Hastily, I took it out of my pocket. It was Mike. I took the call and started barking at him. Really funny, guys. I thought we agreed on something. What are you talking about? I'm talking about you trying to mess with me. I clearly saw you, and now you can come out. Mike, as if frozen for a minute, for what seemed like an eternity, all I could hear was his heavy breathing and Paul mumbling something in the background. And when he finally snapped back to reality, he just said, Dude, we're at your house. We heard some footsteps, and at first we thought you were just trying to mess with us. But then we got scared and decided to look after you. I forgot the phone at your house, so we couldn't even give you a call. Just get the heck out of there, and we'll come back for our stuff together. B.S. That's just another one of your funny pranks, and I'm not buying it. Hold on a second. For a while, all I could hear was some incoherent mumbling. Hey, what's going on? Asked the voice of my mom coming from the phone. My head suddenly spun and my heart skipped a beat as I realized that they weren't kidding. Suddenly, a freezing wave of fear ran through my body. However, I managed to convince mom that everything was just fine and that she didn't need to worry. She gave the phone back to Mike. Just leave everything and come back. We're heading out now. We'll meet you halfway there. I'm not going anywhere alone again. You better get your butts here and do it quick. I'm waiting for you. But, I hung up. I didn't wish to make any more noise than I already did. I quickly turned off my flashlight and started to back off from the light of the fire. I moved all the way to the huge wall of rocks. I figured that if I had my bag covered by the rocks, I could eliminate one of the possible ways that unwanted visitors could approach me. I was standing there in a complete darkness, trying not to make a sound while tightly clutching my hatchet, which would be for the next half an hour my best friend. I had to constantly convince myself not to curl into a ball in fear. Even my own body started to betray me. As my hearing got worse due to my savagely beating heart, I was trying to calm myself. But then again, in worst case scenario, every little bit of adrenaline would help. After what seemed like an eternity, I spotted two weak light beams coming from the forest. I heard Paul shout my name. I had never been so relieved. I finally ran out from my hiding to greet my two friends. For quite some time, we were just standing there, laughing like maniacs from relief. We were even getting a bit cocky, and we thought about staying. After all, there was just one supposedly creep lurking between the trees and there were three of us. It's funny, just minutes earlier, I was crapping myself with fear, and now I was suddenly full of tough macho thinking, what could possibly happen? In the end, healthy judgments got the better of us and we decided to leave. We packed our things, put out the fire and got out. We took our bottles of wine to enjoy somewhere else, somewhere where it's nice and brightly lit. The Hester House was a legend passed down from class to class in my high school over the decades. Students and even teachers told a variation of a story about a house belonging to one of the earliest families in our community, in central Pennsylvania that burned down a century earlier, but reappears with the first full moon in October. The story was based on a real house that belonged to a family 
which owns much of the land in the county but sold it off for residential and commercial development over the decades. When the house burned down in the 1950s, it took with it the last of the Hester family line. The problem was that no one knew where the house had been. There were some old foundations along the southern slope of Peter's Mountain, but none of them could be linked, historically, to such a house. The only history was that of the suburban legend which evolved over the years. The one thing that remains constant was the promise of a treasure hidden under the floorboards of the house. If you found the house while it existed in our realm, you might find cash, gold, and jewels enough to make you rich. Of course, if you didn't get out of the house before it disappeared, you would go with it and become a ghost inside its walls forever. Of course, this was the excuse used by high school kids over the years to go into the woods up on Peter's Mountain, to camp or have a bonfire or really try to find the house. In the 1980s, it was still a time when parents didn't mind their kids being gone overnight, and none of us had cell phones. Overnight games of Dungeons and Dragons were common on weekends, and my gaming group was led by the kid who lived at the base of Peter's Mountain. He and his brothers loved the story of Hester House and as October approached that one year, he took a break to persuade us to leave our tabletop adventure and go on a real one. We were a group of six boys aged 16 to 17, and it was easy for us to tell our parents that we were staying over at Cliff's house for a marathon weekend D&D session. But instead, we gathered a camping material and agreed to head up to the mountain to a small campsite Cliff knew. And as the full moon rose over the mountain, search for the Hester house. Of these six of us, we lost the 16 year old for lack of permission. We lost two more who chickened out. So the three of us remaining had to split the gear, which put us behind schedule for the camp. The woods were damp and leaves were already falling across the trail, making the shallow uphill slippery and the steeper climbs treacherous. Getting up in the daylight was going to be fine, but after dark, there would be two miles between camp and Cliff's home, and another three miles back to town, so we were committed. We reached the clearing where Cliff and his brothers and a lot of Hester House seekers made camp. It was a relatively flat area with a view down the mountain into the trees, but we were totally insulated by trees and cut off from the world by the sound of the forest with only the regular whistle of a distant train to cut through it. By the time that we reached the camp, we had lost a half hour and scrambled to assemble dry firewood, start a fire, and get the tent pitched. The wind rose from the west and cut through the trees, making our activities difficult. From there, things started to fall apart. There were poles missing from the tent bag, and we could only find a limited supply of dry firewood to get the campfire started. The wind freshened and darkness swept over us as the sun sets behind the mountaintop and clouds approached from that direction. The temperature plummeted from the mid 50s while we worked up a sweat to the low 40s with a chilling breeze. Cliff and I struggled to improvise solutions for the tent, using branches to prop up walls and tying others to trees with a nylon rope. Meanwhile, Keith fumbled and stumbled, trying to get the fire lit, resorting to lighting an entire box of matches under the kindling, and a gamble to get the fire lit, and hot enough to dry out the moist firewood. We knew that any significant rain was going to put it out, and we would be huddled together in our sleeping bags under a sagging tent all night. We abandoned the idea of searching for Hester House and prepared to weather a storm. Once we had established some kind of camp, the rain held off for a while, just bringing a cold drizzle. We took turns, maintaining the fire and threw shade at one another for not checking the equipment or planning for the weather, and generally being miserable. As the light faded, we heard movement in the woods around us. Definitely human footfalls through the leaves and underbrush, we decided. It cut through the sound of dry leaves rustling and falling from the whistling wind through the trees and the updraft that blustered up the side of the mountain. Suddenly, a big object landed right in the middle of the campfire, throwing hot embers and burning twigs in every direction, including our tents. 
The evening brightened in a dance of fireflies over the fire. We stepped out to find out what had happened. Did a tree limb fall? Was it a wet branch popping with boiling water pockets? But it was a rock the size of a basketball. Cliff pointed out to the dark figure standing in the trees on the far side of the fire. It was a tall, husky figure, standing slightly hunched like he was getting ready to charge or run away. Movement through the woods resumed and we detected three other people about 50 feet up and down the mountain around the campsite. The first figure we saw stood motionless for moments. Cliff yelled, more ticked off than afraid. Who are you guys? Don't mess with the fire. The first figure started laughing. It wasn't another kid. It was an older, raspy laugh joined by other older sounding voices and laughter. A softball sized rock struck a tree trunk over my head and bounced off to one side. Another sailed over Keith's head and struck the tent, snapping the branch holding up the one side. We scattered. I don't know what the others were thinking, but I wanted to keep trees between me and as many of them as I could. The laughter intensified and more rocks landed in the campsite. I slipped in the wet leaves and slid down towards one of the men, and he rushed forward towards me, arms out. He was wide and slow, juggling as he advanced and laughing like it was the funniest thing he had done all year. He slipped and planted himself face first in the muddy ground. By that time, I had traction and I was heading back up the slope towards camp. I took a small rock to the shoulder but he glanced off my padded shoulder and I kept moving. I got to the camp and one of the men was standing in front of the fire, his features still in shadow. He pointed at me and roared, Leave Hester House alone. He then took a couple of burning logs and tossed them into the tent. He ran off, chased by the others in the same general direction. Cliff and Keith rushed back. The tent was a loss, we had to smother it, and then it began to rain. A wall of rain rushed in from the west and it poured so hard that it put out the fires and left us in darkness. We huddled together to be able to talk over the rain. Are they gone? Where'd they go? What did we do? We had flashlights and, while cold and soaked, we were uninjured. We gotta get out of here. We heard footsteps in the darkness and a single beam of light shot out from the forest over us. The voice from before screamed, Leave the Hester house alone. Get out of here or we'll kill you. We abandoned our gear except for our flashlight and Keith led us away from the site down the mountain. We were moving at half the speed coming up. It was sloppy and slippery and the rain was relentless. We slid on our butts over these steep parts and had to stop to work out a way down that wouldn't risk breaking our legs or necks. Every time that we stopped, a rock would sail between us and snap against other rocks or a tree, and a voice would shriek at us to, Go, go, I will bury you on this mountain. I want the skinny one, she's cute. A rock hit Keith in the cheek and nearly sent him over an incline, but he dropped to his knees to keep from rolling. It dazed him, but his adrenaline kept him moving as the skin swelled and darkened. I said the first thing that I thought of to Cliff. If these are your brothers and your friends, Cliff, I will be so pissed. Cliff shook his head. Not them. They would never do this. And I believed him. But most of the town dating back a generation or more did know about the Hester House story and the date. It would be easy for someone with bad intentions to come out into the woods on the first full moon and wait for a bunch of stupid, unprepared kids to make a camp far from witnesses. Suddenly, the stories about kids going missing inside the Hester house trying to get the treasure made me think that if anyone actually did go missing on a dark night in the woods and the house was just a cover story too. A rock hit me between the shoulder blade with the power of a fastball. I felt something pop in my spine, and a sharp shock went up and down my entire body. After what felt like hours in the increasing darkness, dry heaving from the panic and the struggle, coughing and spitting up snot and rainwater, we came to the road close to Cliff's house. 
There is a man standing under the streetlight by the street. He had the same predatory hunch as the man at the campsite. Soon, three or four other figures appeared and blocked our way. We stopped and they began moving towards us. Suddenly, our silent prayers were answered when a truck rolled around a corner heading up the hill, and it bathed them in the headlights, blinding them. They were not kids or young adults. These were older men, faces in their 50s or 60s, bloated and wrinkled, covered in dirty clothes and windbreakers. They were ugly, evil-looking men who had worn us down to exhaustion and were ready to strike. The truck did not slow down, but it gave us a break. Cliff pulled us to one side of the path and back into the woods, along a smaller, natural path along the road. With a supernatural reserve of strength, we cut through the barbs and brush like rabbits eluding wolves, and came out scratched and scraped across the street from Cliff's house. The porch light was lit and the garage door was wide open. Cliff's dad was working on something inside of the garage. We heard the men chasing us along the road, but once they saw the lights of the house, they stopped. We didn't stop until we were in the garage yelling to Cliff's dad that there were bad men after us. Cliff's dad called the cops. Cliff's mom took us inside, dried us off, and helped tend to our injuries. The cops never found anyone, but they scolded us for being irresponsible enough to go camping in the woods without supervision or preparation. The sergeant there saved his strongest words for Cliff's parents, effectively ending our weekend at D&D games. Prevailing wisdom was that it was probably some old guys who lived over the mountain who just wanted to scare some kids out on Hester House night, and they dismissed our dramatic interpretation of the peril which was, in their minds, the product of our excitement and hormones. The newspaper took a decidedly Halloween approach to the story, spinning it as a tantalizing tale of transient stalking local kids on a camping trip with who knows what in mind when they caught us. But weird Hester House guardians in the woods. It's been 30 years, but if I'm ever in the neighborhood again, my hope we never meet. About a year ago, me and some friends went out to celebrate my birthday. After going to a movie, one of my friends asked if I wanted to go out to the club and bar with her. I said sure, but everyone else wanted to get home as they had to work the next day and were tired and so on. My friend Katie, her cousin Megan, and I headed to the club. We were having a good time, dancing, drinking a little bit, whatever. And then Katie saw a cute guy who she wanted to get with. She started steering our group over to his group, which was conveniently made up of him and two other dudes. We all get to chatting and it's relatively innocent. And then the boys asked us if we wanted to go to a bonfire at their work. And they said a bunch of people would be there and it would be fun. I was a little nervous, but Katie was really feeling this guy, so I decided why not. We left the club and we followed the three guys about 20 minutes away. We drove in a car, but we each had DDs. The distance was starting to really sketch me out, but I tried to stay relaxed. We pulled up to this huge chain wire fence with a gate and the guys typed in a code on a box that that's open the gate. We drove through and the gate closed behind us. I looked around but saw no bonfire and no other people. Now, I was really starting to get scared. We were in a solitary, enclosed space with three strange men, but everyone was smiling and laughing as we got out of the car, and I figured I was probably being paranoid. The boys said that their co-workers had bailed and that they were sorry. I asked where we were and Katie's guy told us that they were at a haunted house, not the paranormal kind, but the fake Halloween kind which was currently out of season since it was May. He worked there in the fall, but he had a code. He asked us if we wanted to take a tour through the house and see the behind the scenes of how it all works. I thought that sounded really cool and we all agreed. He led us into the actor's room where these scarers would hang out. A door in it led to this sort of maze of back pathways where actors could run through the house unseen and jump out in various locations at visitors. Now, I should mention that, by this point, the three guys had each selected a girl which whom they were trying to score with. The guy who had chosen me, Brian, was average looking, about six foot tall and had dark hair. 
He seemed a little odd, like he didn't really know the other two that well. But they were all friends, so whatever. As we begin walking through the main pathway of the haunted house, Megan and the guy that she's with disappears in the back pathways. Suddenly, all the lights go off, fog appears, and the music and noises of the house start. I know that the two of them had gone off and turned the house on, but that didn't make it any less scary. I was now in an off-season haunted house alone with three strange guys, one of who was using the darkness as an excuse to grab onto me, even though I kept pushing him off. I held onto the back of Katie's shirt, scared to death that I would lose her in the maze of hallways and be stuck alone with Brian. I was desperate to get out of the haunted house, unsure where Megan or the guy that she was with were, or if they were going to pop out and scare us or if she was even okay. But it felt like no matter where we turned, we weren't moving anywhere. We kept passing through the same room with a fake sarcophagus in it. I thought to myself, how the heck can I get out of this thing? Katie and her dude were obviously having a lot more fun than I was, as they giggled and walked ahead of us around a corner. When I followed them around the turn, they were gone. Now, I was truly alone with Brian. He wrapped his arm tightly around my waist and I pulled back, saying, Hey, I'm really scared. I want to get out of this house. How do we get out? He told me that he didn't know. I responded, Don't you work here? No, he said. I just met those two guys at the club tonight. Alarms were sounding in my head, and I was in full panic mode. I took my phone out of my pocket and I texted Katie, Where the heck are you? I want to get out of here, before I started pushing my way through the rest of the house. Finally, after what felt like hours of endless turns and hallways, and Brian grinding accidentally against me and asking me, Why are you freaking out? Relax. I found the exit door. As I pushed through it into the open air of the outdoors, I felt a little better. Outside of the haunted house, I tried to reason with myself that these guys were probably harmless and I was being silly. I checked my phone, but Katie hadn't texted me back. I decided that I was going to sit by the car and wait for them to return from wherever they were. Brian kept trying to talk me into walking with him somewhere else, but I refused. He checked his phone and said, Oh, so-and-so texted me. He and Katie are out by the lake. You want to go there? I desperately wanted to reunite with my friend, who had the car keys, and get the heck out of there, so I agreed. We headed down a dark path towards the lake, and when we got there, I didn't see anyone. I called out for Katie, but I heard no response. Brian said, Oh, they must have left already and gone back to the house or something. I'll text so-and-so to come back. I sat down on the picnic table to wait, and that's when Brian made his move. He sat beside me and then leaned over and aggressively kissed me, placing my hand on his groin, which was rock hard already. I pulled back and politely said, No thank you, I'm not in the mood. He tried again and again and I said no. Come on, just for a bit. He urged, placing my hand once more in his crotch. I stood up and I walked a few steps away, shaking my head. Brian's expression changed. His eyes darkened and his mouth set into a hard line. He stood up and he started pacing in back and forth in front of me. You've been freaking leading me on all night, you tease. Why the heck do the other two get girls who are DTF while I'm stuck here with you? All you girls are the same. I'm not good enough and I've never been good enough. And then he turned to look at me and said something that sent shivers down my spine. You know, a lot of guys wouldn't be so nice to you. Out here all alone. A lot of guys wouldn't give you a choice. My phone beeped as he finished speaking and I looked down to a text from Katie saying, We're in the back office watching a movie. We've been here the whole time. Come join. Katie had never been at the lake. Brian had made that text up to get me out here alone. At this point, I was more frightened than I had ever been, and I didn't want to give that away. I didn't want to give Brian the satisfaction of knowing that he had scared me. So I turned and walked back to the haunted house with Brian about 10 feet behind. When I got back to the office, I told Katie and Megan who were cuddled up on the floor with the two other guys that I wanted to leave. And Katie promised that we would in a few minutes. 
Now I asked for the car keys at least, so I could sit in the car and avoid Brian, who was standing in the office corner with his arms crossed. I went to the car and sat in the back seat with the doors locked for over an hour, texting Katie every few minutes begging her to hurry up. It was now 4.30 a.m. and I was scared, tired, and cold. At one point, Brian walked towards the car from the office, standing about 8 feet away and just staring at me. I kept the doors locked and avoided making eye contact. Finally, at 5 a.m., Katie and Megan walk out to the car and we leave. I get home and I pass out from exhaustion. When I wake up, I have a Snapchat friend request. When I check it, it's from Brian X 21 Apparently, Katie thought that we had hit it off and gave him my Snapchat name. Needless to say, I blocked his Snapchat and I no longer speak to Katie. I was lucky that nothing truly bad happened that night. But when I think of what could have been, when I think about Brian's voice and the veiled threats behind his words, my heart still skips a beat. So Brian, I sincerely hope I never meet you again. It happened on July 29th, 2020. It was on a Saturday morning when my little front door was softly knocked by one of my best friends. We'll call him Fitz. Fitz had turned 17 last week and his father decided to buy him a new hunting rifle. He was excited to get it and he wanted to show me how cool it was. Besides a little sprinkle of jealousy, I was excited too to go on my first hunting trip. I remember every little detail of how everything went horribly wrong on that trip in my head, as if it just happened a minute ago. Fitz's 26 year old brother Dan picked us up in his pickup truck at 6.43. Dan is the nicest outdoor guy that I've ever met. He talks so softly but he's built like the Hulk. The only simple way to explain how he looks was like, imagine a cowboy, a gymnast, and lives in a town but is British. That's how I would explain what he would look like. I couldn't remember how long I had known Dan and Fitz. It feels like they had been in my life since the day that I was born. I took a shotgun while Fitz sat on the back of the truck, glancing his long rifle with amazement. On the 20 minute trip, Dan was giving me so many updates about his life during Corona, including the girl that he had been hitting on for the past few weeks. As a brother, I felt like there were no boundaries between us. When we arrived at the site, I was expecting birds to be shouting here and there like in the movies, but there wasn't any. I could hear a cricket and a toad every now and then though, but I was still kind of disappointed. I was expecting the whole bird captivity on my head, but then reality really hits. I don't have a gun or a rifle, so Dan handed me his homemade spear for fishing. It's faster than using a rod, but be careful with your feet, he said. It was the first time that I went hunting and everything was so interesting to me. Being a boy who had a spear in his hand, I kept asking for something spear fishing related. Maybe or maybe not, my continuous questioning started to bother Dan. So he sent me and Fitz to a riverbank to figure it out for ourselves. I was standing near the riverbank while Fitz was prone not far away from me aiming his rifle to the tree across the river. I barely even tried to catch a fish. I was looking at him the whole time. He took his first shot and it wasn't good. His body pushed back and he was barely able to maintain the rifle in his hand. I laughed and then he laughed. We mocked about how bad that first shot was. We got distracted for a few minutes before he decided to give it another shot. I was jabbing randomly at every single movement I could see on the water surface, hoping one of them was a fish, and that it would be my first catch. I was no longer staring at Fitz, but I could hear every shot that he took, until I heard a different sound than the shots. It sounded so much louder but further than what Fitz's rifle had. My first thought was, wow, Dan wasn't playing around about hunting. Since we'd scattered, he had went out on his own. One shot, two shots, and then three shots. There was nothing weird about this shot. Even if it's not Dan, maybe it's another hunter. Until the fourth shot hit a tree behind us and it was cracked. Somebody had shot it. 
I couldn't see it, but I'm sure that's how it sounds when it hits a tree. I threw myself down to the ground, while Fitz did the opposite. He raised his head from his prone position, trying to find where the shot came from. Seconds later, another shot was fired and I was frightened. I could hear the bullet passing through the air. It was close, so close. I tossed my spear to the ground and I got up and I ran towards Fitz and grabbed his hand and as fast as I could, dragged him out of there and back to where Dan's truck was. Another shot was fired at us and my heart skipped a beat. My body was shaken and my knees felt so limp for a moment. I almost wept at that moment. But I took a deep breath and I kept running with Fitz, I kept muttering words that I couldn't hear. We arrived at Dan's truck and were confused about whether we should call the cops or not. We decided to call Dan first and let him decide because he was the adult. He decided to call the police and then two police arrived almost 15 minutes later. We told every single detail to Dan during that 20 minute period and let Dan explain everything to the police. They swept the area for another 15 minutes and then came back with nothing. They couldn't find anything, not even footprints. They asked us to file a report, but Dan decided not to, because nobody got hurt. We sat in silence on the drive home. Alter scenarios playing in my head like a movie. What if, I thought to myself. I'm not sure that I could forget how clear that bullet sounded like when it was near me. It'll haunt me at night, and it has been. Dan told my parents about this, and they were just glad that we're okay. Everything went back to normal on Sunday, like there was nothing going on. But what if one of us hadn't made it to Dan's truck? Would everything be the same? This happened back in 2004 in northern Wisconsin. I was 16 at the time and out deer hunting with my dad and a friend of his, Frank. I remember this day like it was yesterday. The dialogue isn't word for word, but the idea of it is 100% accurate. My dad and I had a few different stands over an area of maybe three quarters of a square mile. He had been hunting there for at least 10 years and I had been going with him since I was 5. Up until I was 12, the legal age to hunt with a rifle, I had just been tagging along. This particular morning, we walked to my stand first. It was about 5am, so still dark outside. I got situated and my dad and Frank went off to our other two stands over a ridge maybe another 500 to 600 yards off. Sitting there in the dark is always a little eerie. Not long after my dad and Frank left, I see a flashlight from the general direction of where they headed, maybe 200 yards away, roughly moving in my direction. I figured that they forgot something from the truck or something, so I radioed to see what they were doing. We're sitting in the stand. Frank is about to head to the other one, he says. Obviously, this flashlight is someone else. This isn't super uncommon and it really isn't a big deal. Those woods get crowded sometimes and there is a spot to park in that general direction. I turn on my light so the other hunter can see that there is someone there. He stops. I see the light turn and go a different direction. No big deal. I end up dozing off while it's still dark out. When I wake up, the sun is up. It's around 8am. I sit there for a bit, radio my dad to see if he has heard or seen anything moving. Nothing yet. A couple gunshots off in the distance is all. I get up and I go for a slow little walk to get my blood moving again. So far, maybe 30 yards out and back, trying not to make a sound. I come back to my stand, sit down and take a real good look around. Nothing really going on. I finally look out to my left, where I had seen the flashlight before and I see orange. For anyone unfamiliar, hunters have to wear blaze orange during gun season. I radioed my dad and Frank to see if either one of them were moving around. Dad says no. I hear nothing from Frank. I grab the binoculars out of my backpack to see if it's Frank. It's definitely not. This guy is looking at me through his scope. Rifle aimed directly at me. This is a huge no-no. Massive rule that we all learn in hunter's education. 
Never point your rifle at something you don't intend to shoot. Dumb people still do it, though. It's few and far between, but it happens. This is why normal people use binoculars. My first thought is, what a freaking douche. The thing is, even with me looking at him, he doesn't put his gun down. Now I'm starting to panic, thinking that I'm going to be the next hunting murder victim. I slowly grab my rifle and get up, staying behind as many trees as I can, and I walk down a little path to the side of my stand. My stand was on this kind of little knoll on the side of a much larger hill. I radio my dad and I tell him what's up. He tells me to sit tight and stay out of sight. Obviously, as a 16 year old, I couldn't do that and I had to keep looking. Every time I looked, the guy was still aiming in my direction, but was always standing in a different spot. Like I would look, go back to hiding, look again, and he would be 30 yards from where he was the last time. About 10 minutes of this goes by when my dad radios me. How you doing, bud? Looking back, he was very obviously trying to keep me calm. At the time, I thought he just wasn't taking me seriously. He's still there, but he keeps moving. I don't know what his problem is. Dad told me to just keep hidden and he'll figure it out. That he'll be coming up near him in a minute or two. And that's when I hear the shot. I lost my crap trying to get a hold of my dad. Did he just get shot? Where the heck is he? Did he have to shoot the guy? What's going on? I sit there for maybe two to three minutes that felt like hours. Alright, come on out and head towards my stand. I peek over the little knoll I was behind and see my dad waving from along the ridge that the random guy had been on. I make the trek over to him to see what happened. It turns out Frank was feeling a little restless and took a little stroll and ended up on the other side of that particular ridge that the stranger is on, not knowing that he was there. He had knocked his radio battery loose while he was getting situated earlier in the morning, and had no idea anything was even going on. The shot that I heard was actually Frank shooting a deer. Dad said as soon as Frank shot, the guy walked off away from us towards the logging road. We helped Frank out with his deer and decided to call it an early day. Although I was extremely nervous, the rest of the week went on without any incidents. I love waking up in the dark and walking the sunrise with my dogs. I didn't intend to own two huskies and a German Shepherd mix, but they each found me and I couldn't turn them away. We usually jog about 5 miles daily, often in the neighborhood, but nearly as often I load us up in the van and drive 10 minutes to the wooded metro park. I love it there. They offer some trails that allow quads and motorbikes and some bicycles and skis. Some just people. And last year, they opened a new one that allows pets. It's a five-mile loop into the area farthest from the city. We live on the northern edge of town, but in the dark with no leaves in the trees, you can clearly see the red glow of the CVS sign for most of the hike. These are tamed woods with asphalt paths and concrete fire pits, and rangers patrolling normally. And the hospital behind CVS means that there's emergency medical care within walking distance. I was up coughing again in the night. I had a serious case of pneumonia two months ago and was not fully recovered when this sinus infection hit me. I'm past the fever part so we're walking, not yet jogging again. But after being up in the night, I didn't get up in time to go walk before I dropped my kids off at school. And then my youngest had an appointment and then I had to run a few errands. And then we had unexpected visitors right after school. And then they stayed for dinner. And finally, I got the dogs into the van and we made it to the park just before it started to get dark. I was irritated at all the little things that kept me from my walk all day. But as we drove all the way to the back of the park, I realized that we would be walking the sunset, watching it over the lake and the hills and through the bare trees. And the park was clearing out now. As it started towards dark, we would very nearly have the place to ourselves and might not have to pull off the path to let others pass us. An amazing number of people who are afraid of dogs hike the pet path. 
All those little irritations that led up to the singular moment of beauty I would not otherwise have seen and appreciated. This was going to be a really good walk. It's funny how life works out when you let it. I parked in my spot at the farthest end of the parking lot by the bathrooms. A mile long, people, walkers or joggers only path looped through the woods, and by the lake came out by the bathrooms. I liked to run it when I came here alone. It was a glorious walk through a Bob Ross painting. My mind cleared and my thoughts quieted and I simply experienced the woods, my feet on the path, my dogs panting, the nature sounds, the beauty of the sky. I absolutely loved it. About halfway now and the city sounds had faded away until I could only hear the birds and frogs and insects all singing their songs of territory and mating and life. And then a crack. Utter silence and absolute stillness. My dogs and I turned instantly towards the source of the sound and froze. Behind us and to the right, the sound had come from the crest of a hill. I could see nothing and heard only the dogs panting. I waited for the nature sounds to return. They did not. All three of the dogs slowly raised their ruffs, first standing on end to all of their shoulders and necks, tails held tall and proud, making themselves look larger and more threatening. I took a step towards them and the female husky, the leader of my little pack, instantly put her ears back and her head down and pulled me down the path. All three of them left their tails and ruffs up, but the two males also put their ears back and heads down and began to pull me, so off we went. The woods were still silent. We must have startled a buck on the slope of the hill, not seen him, and after we had passed, he leapt up the hill and jumped a dead tree, and his hoof hit a dead branch and the branch broke, and heard that cracking sound and scared everyone. But why were the woods still silent? Maybe there was something up there. Homeless people must stay here sometimes. The bathrooms have heat so the pipes don't freeze. But this is about as far out as the path goes. It would be a good place to sleep. Maybe he's setting up a shelter and crack broke a branch. But why were the woods still silent? We were about as far from the city as we could get in these woods and you couldn't see the CVS sign or the glow from streetlights or even hear the traffic noises. It was dark and still, and absolutely quiet except for the panting dogs and four sets of footsteps on the path. I wanted to run. The dogs wanted to run. Bigfoot. There is a Bigfoot breaking a log to say, get out. There are no Bigfoot in city limits, I promise you that. Brain, come on, it was a deer. The woods are still quiet because of us. I have 200 pounds of dog here. Yes, they're the big huskies and another 200 pounds of me. Yeah, I'm a little fat, but I've got good muscle underneath. I have broad shoulders that don't fit into women's shirts and big hands that don't fit into women's gloves. I can lift 100 pounds over my head. We are the scariest thing in these woods. There's no bear, there's no wolves, there's no Bigfoot. There are deer and there are foxes and there might be an angry raccoon, but we are the biggest, baddest, scariest thing in these woods. Unless there's someone with a gun. Shut up, you're not helping. The dogs had not stopped once to sniff or mark. Heads down, ears back, tails and ruffs still held high. They just wanted to go. We had gone almost a mile now, me craning my head the whole time, trying to see as far as I could in all directions while letting the dogs pull me down the path. And it was still absolutely silent. Not an overflying goose, not a cricket. Nothing moved. Nothing made a sound. Except us. Here came the third and longest of the three steep hills on this trail. I had been running these to rebuild my strength and endurance. But if I ran this, I would be blown at the top. The top where it curved around as it crested and you couldn't see anything past the thick trees. The top where, if you were deeper in the woods, you could follow a more gradual ridge up to the crest of the hill and wait, unseen for someone to come up the path. Ambush. It was a deer. Turn around. It was just a deer. What if it's behind us? Ambush, deer, gun, Bigfoot. This is why I run. 
The noise in my head is unbearable otherwise. Up the hill, walk, pay attention, watch the dogs. The dogs were still on high alert, but they didn't hesitate to go up the hill. In fact, they wanted to go faster. Just don't walk. Don't get smoked. Be able to run or fight if you have to. Yeah, okay, I'm scared too. The woods should not still be silent. The dogs should not still be on alert. It's not a cat or a bear or a wolf, and I really doubt it's Bigfoot. But it could be a person, so let's be smart. Just walk. We are not good prey. The dogs will protect me. The huskies might not alone, but the shepherd will. And they'll follow his lead. Be smart and get out. Only another mile now to the lake and the first parking lot. And then another half mile along the way to the second lot, where my van was. Hearing traffic noises now, but still no birds, no crickets, no frogs. The smell almost stopped me in my tracks, but the dogs kept pulling. Sour and grassy and oddly metallic, and crap. Crap and blood, and partially digested grass. I smelled the contents of a deer's stomach. Someone hunted these woods, and the dogs were not at all interested in the smell. We ran. I don't remember much of that last mile, we just ran. Desna, the big female husky, finally stopped to drink some lake water as we came out by the parking lot. And then she began to sniff and pee. And the boys followed her lead. There is a single truck part. I relaxed quite a bit, but still I felt on edge. Down the lake at the next parking lot, I could see headlights. They must be parked at the turnaround at the end of the lot closest to the lake. Their headlights illuminated the lakeside path. They're watching us. I'm halfway to the van now, and the car drove away. Twenty feet from the van, and I heard a motor coming down the nearest path. I decided to put the dogs in the car on the driver's side instead of the passenger side like normal. The sound of the motor came closer. The leashes caught on the armrest, and I had to untangle them before the dogs could jump into the van. The motor came closer down the path. I had to be gone before it came out. I knew it with an absolute certainty. Finally, the dogs were in. I slammed the door and I jumped in the front, fumbling for the lock button, shaking hands and clipping the keys from my dragging belt, starting the car and gunning it into reverse. And as my headlights swept over the entrance of the path by the bathrooms, they lit up a four-wheeler coming out of the woods. I was dropping the transmission into drive and hitting the gas. And as my brain processed what my eyes saw, it informed me that there was something across the handlebars. A gun. A deer carcass. I couldn't tell and because of the angle when pulling away, I couldn't see him in the rearview mirror at all. Shortly after I turned 19, my two friends decided to take me out to a game cafe near my house. It's also a bar once the night hits. So of course, given that I live in Canada, meaning 19 is the age to start having legal alcohol-induced fun. It was the perfect setting to get a bit tipsy and play some innocent board games with friends. We decided to drink. One of the friends that was with me was the designated driver, Hunter, while the other Wayne only drinks tequila. I had never tried it, so we decided tonight was the night to cross that off my non-existent bucket list. For some humor, I'll mention that I remember hearing the guy behind the bar chuckling in a little while. Wayne ordered the tequilas and I told Hunter, who was sitting at our table, that I would be back. As I turned to walk to the bar, the bartender was lifting the two shots onto the counter. You two are crazy, he said while shaking his head with a laugh. Admitted so, we took our shots and went back to the table that Hunter was waiting at. Me across the table from him, and Wayne sitting beside him, and diagonal from me. Everything went well for a while, until about 1.15 in the morning. At this point, people were frequently going in and out for smokes or to go home as the place closed at 2am. I was already pretty tipsy, 
Having finished drinking an hour or so before as my stomach long ago, I had decided for me that I should never get full on drunk. I was still very noticeably intoxicated, however, and so was the man that had just entered the cafe. Because of my alcohol level, I get spacey as one does, and the fact of the door already opening frequently, I had stopped turning my head to the door every time that it did so. Due to this, I was completely unaware that this man, with mostly brown but also gray hair, implying that he was on the older side, but not yet old enough to be considered elderly, man wearing blue jeans and a jacket, was stumbling over to where I was sitting. My friends and I were at the table closest to the door, but it was a diagonal from it. The door was in the middle of the wall with a tiny lounge area with a couch and a coffee table to the left, while inside looking at the door in the corner. Beside that against the wall connected to the door's wall were the actual tables for sitting and eating, and we were at the one closest to the lounge area. This made it easy for him to walk to my table without falling over, as he was heavily intoxicated. I was, as stated, unaware of this but hearing about it afterwards really creeped me out. Apparently, once he got to the table, he put his hand on the back of my chair, as my chair and therefore I was faced away from the door. I'm proudly for support, but given his creepy aura, it still jars me. According to my friends, he then slowly leaned to either smell my hair or whisper in my ear. He was only a few inches away, eyes trained in me, while Hunter finally noticed. Before he could say something after opening his mouth to, the two bartenders came over. Once they started talking and saying that he is too drunk to be in here and should please leave now if he isn't going to order anything, I turned my head around to look at him, which admittedly made me jump a little as he was very, very close to my face. His expression was blank, eyes shining. This only lasted a second though, as he then quickly pulled back, now without shooting a quick smile my way though, turned to the bartenders and said that he would order. However, he never ended up doing so. I was now a little on edge and the alcohol didn't quite help, as alcohol only serves to alleviate whatever mood I'm currently in. I wasn't checking the time, so I don't know how long all of this lasted, but before I knew it, he was once again leaning on the back of my chair. However, I noticed it this time because rather than leaning straight down on my ear, he leaned outwards and down, rotating his torso in my direction. This meant that he, as he leaned, entered my peripheral vision, and when I whipped my head to the side to look at him, as he did so, Due to how he positioned himself, I was looking straight at his face rather than up at it like last time. His expression was blank once more, until he registered that I was looking at him, which made a soft smile lift his lips again. My head swiftly turned back towards my friends, hopefully delivering the message of, uh, help, through my eyes to Hunter as they made direct contact with his. I scooted my chair closer to the table and he followed, albeit ungracefully, due to having his hand on the back. The sounds of my chair scuffling the floor and his feet stumbling against the wood must have alerted the bartenders once more as they came back again. I'm sorry sir, but you have to leave. You're too drunk to be in here. They stated more firmly, now revoking their offer to serve him. He responded something along the lines of, Yeah, okay. The amount of alcohol he had clearly had was slurring his words. But once more, he didn't listen to their orders. Instead, as they walked back to the bar, he pushed himself off of my chair after correcting his posture so that he could sway over to the chair beside me. Thankfully, there was a pillar very close to the back of my chair. Nobody wanted to sit against the pillar as they couldn't pull your chair out. This meant the chair while next to me wasn't as close pressed as Wayne and Hunter's chairs were. 
Once he got to said chair, he stood beside it for a moment, swaying through the alcohol-induced fog in his brain, and then reached for his coat. Soon, his coat was draped over the back of the chair, and he was pulling it out by the back as he looked at me. However, before he could fall onto the seat, the bartenders were back over. This time, they truly meant business. Sir, one said, looking over at me before quickly looking back at the man, as I'm sure he noticed my unnerved expression. You really have to leave. This is the last time that we're going to tell you that you are way too drunk to be in here, so you have to go. Now. Let out a sigh of relief, I saw him nod his head as he finally broke his gaze from me. He slurred a confirmation, grabbing his coat and standing up. The bartenders reached out as he nearly stumbled over, but he caught his balance as he simultaneously shrugged on his coat. My gaze followed him as I turned my head around to watch him shuffle to the door. He grabbed at the handle and whipped it open with much more force than needed. So much force, in fact, it made him stumble back slightly, and then he was gone and out the door. The bartenders apologized to me soon after, and I went home. I've never seen him again, and I hope not to. I am a 31-year-old woman. This happened a few years back. I was walking from a friend's house to meet my son's father, Ax, at a bar that we frequented in those days. It was winter, icy and snowing, with giant piles of snow all around. I was walking from a friend's house around 9pm down an alley that served as a driveway area for many houses. Not a great neighborhood, but not so bad either. I was wearing my apocalypse boots. Waterproof, knee-high, winterproof. I usually have headphones and blaring music while I walk. But that night, for some reason, I decided not to. In hindsight, that's what saved me. I was about the equivalent of two to three blocks away from the bar. There is a younger guy, early 20s, walking about 50 feet behind me. May you! I turn around. It seems like he's talking to someone else. Hey! I look back and then continue walking. Yeah, you! Don't turn around, sweetheart. I start to walk faster and I realize that he's getting closer. Ahead of me, I see an SUV running. Backed out of a parking spot, but blocking my path. My turn around. There's another guy. The door to the SUV opens and there are a couple of guys in it looking at me. One gets out and stands by the open door. I turn to look at the guy behind me and out of nowhere about five more guys come out, surrounding me from a distance, slowly closing in. The realization that they were hiding behind piles of plowed snow hits me. I realize that they are just standing and watching me. A couple of them had their phones out and were recording something that was about to go down. Nobody was smiling but they were closing in on me, trying to get me to walk to the SUV. Fight or flight kicked in and I decided I didn't want to know what was about to happen. I wanted to catch them off guard. So, instead of running forward, I bolted to the left. Thank God for those boots. I could run across the ice, no problem. I ended up cutting through a few yards and I made it to the bar. Guys trying to get me into your SUV while filming. Let's not meet. One time I went to the bar with one of my friends. I had just turned 21, so I hadn't been to much bars up to that point. My friend was drinking on the way to the bar, so he was already pretty drunk when he got there. When I sat at the bar, a cute girl came and talked to me and my friend. She said that her name was Candace, and I noticed that she had really, really bright red hair. I assumed that she dyed it. It was pretty, but unnatural. Anyways... This girl was flirting with me and my friend. She could tell that my friend was already very drunk. 
And to be honest, I played along like I was drunk already too, since it seemed to be working for my friend. I didn't know if she was just trying to get free drinks, so I told her that we didn't have much money. But she offered to buy us drinks. She kept buying us drinks and I started to get confused as to who she liked between me and my friend. My friend went to the bathroom, but before he came back, he was kicked out by the bouncers. He was really too drunk. Candace and I went outside with him. She kept telling him to go home with her. He was so out of it that he could barely answer her. I told her that he was too drunk and that I couldn't let him go anywhere. I didn't want him to wake up hungover in some random house with no car and no idea what happened. But Candace kept pushing it, saying that she would take care of him but I told her no because I had to stay with him. I was more sober than him and he was my responsibility. I told her the only way that he was going anywhere was if I tagged along. I assumed she thought that I was jealous but my friend could barely stand and had lost interest in Candace already at that point. She immediately started flirting with me and offered to give my friend a taxi to drive him home and said that we could go to her place alone. At this point, I had a few drinks and I was pretty buzzed so I agreed. We took my friend to a taxi and walked her to her car. I slightly stumbled on the way to her car. Wow, you're pretty drunk, huh? She said smiling as she had held onto my arm. Yeah, I said. I don't know why, but I just felt slightly shy and anxious. Everything was just happening too easy for me, so I felt uneasy. We got in her car and we drove down the street. Want to stop at the liquor store and get some more to drink? I'll buy it so don't worry about paying, she offered. I didn't want to drink any more than I already did. I was already buzzed and I wanted to be able to carry myself throughout the rest of the night. Sometimes I made myself look stupid when I'm drunk so I didn't want to ruin anything with Candace more than I already did earlier when telling her my friend was too drunk. I told her that I was already drunk enough but she insisted. I didn't want to seem lame so I told her to give me a pint of liquor with some apple juice to chase it. She went in the store and came out with a lot more than just a pint. I assumed that she wanted to drink more also and that's why she got a fifth instead of a pint. On the car ride, we passed the bottle back and forth, but she took tiny steps. I tried to take tiny steps, but she kept passing me the bottle and telling me to drink. I somehow managed to drink all of my apple juice, and pretended to drink the bottle by spitting the liquor in the apple juice bottle. I tossed the apple juice bottle full of liquor out the window before she saw it. I didn't want her to know I was acting drunker than I was and she actually believed I was sloppy drunk when I was simply buzzed. I took a couple more sips of liquor and I finished the bottle. Throughout the car ride, I called her the wrong name a couple of times to get a reaction out of her, but she didn't react to it. She just kept letting me call her Carla without correcting me. For some reason, I thought she lied to me about her name initially. We drove up to her house. I pretended to trip and stumble into her front door. She helped me walk inside by holding me up. She opened her front door, which was unlocked. We walked in her house and she closed her front door and then locked it. I thought that was strange but assumed she didn't want anyone walking in on us. I told her that I had used the bathroom. I walked into her bathroom, locked the door and I looked in the mirror. I just felt strange. I felt like something was off. I felt myself becoming more drunk from finishing the bottle earlier. I turned on the sink to make noise and I made myself puke off the liquor that I drank. I flushed and went to the sink and started drinking the tap water out of my hands to sober up. I just didn't want to be drunk but I still wanted to hook up with Candace so I wanted to pretend to be drunk. I turned the sink off and I could hear her talking to someone. He's drunk as hell. He can barely stand up. You do it. Who is she talking to and to do what? I walked out of the bathroom and into the living room. The moment that I stepped into the living room, I saw her walking into another room. 
All I could see was the back of her head. That's strange, very bright red hair go into another room. I didn't see her face or anything. I just saw her kind of walk fast into the room. The living room was pretty dark. Hey, where you going? I slurred like I was drunk. She walked back into the dark living room and up to me. Let's go in my room, she said. I looked at her bright red hair and then into her eyes. They were different. Her face was different. It was another girl with the same hair. And that's when I realized. It was another girl with the same wig on. It was a wig the whole time. She had changed it with the girl from earlier for whatever reason. My heart felt like it stopped. But I tried to look like I had no idea it was a different girl. I kind of smiled at her and told her that I just needed to use the bathroom one more time and told her sorry I was so drunk. She said, It's fine, just hurry up in there. I went into the bathroom and I locked the door. I heard her whisper something to someone again this time, but I think I heard a male voice whisper back. I honestly didn't concentrate on listening to exactly what she said. Something sketchy was going on and I had to get out of that house. I opened the bathroom window and jumped straight out of it and ran faster than I ever have in my life. I didn't look behind myself or anything. I just ran through the backyard, jumped the fence, ran through someone else's backyard, hit a road, and ran towards the main road. I kept running down the main road until I saw a star CVS. I ran into the CVS and I stood straight at the front of the store in front of the camera. I called a taxi and I went home. I tried to think of what happened that night. What was she or they planning that night? Why did she tell me a fake name? Why was she trying to get my friend and I so drunk? I thought maybe a robbery but she kept spending money on us. She kept buying us drinks and even paid for my friend's taxi cab. Man, mostly, why did she wear a wig that she gave to another girl to wear? Who was she talking to? What did it mean? And what was in that room that they tried to lure me into? So, about two years ago, a friend of mine had moved into his own apartment. The sofa that was in it was old and worn so he decided that he would try and find one in better condition. He asked me to help him look for one as my dad had a van and we would need to use that to transport the sofa. So we went on Craigslist to have a look at what other people had for sale. We came across one ad that stated a three-seater cream leather sofa, great condition, free to first viewer. There was a picture of it and it looked in perfect condition. Now the ads had been up for a week so we thought that maybe it was gone already and that they just hadn't taken the ad down yet. So my friend contacted the seller and nearly instantly got a reply saying that they still had the sofa and it was available if we could collect it. I was a bit wary that it was still available. I mean a free sofa in perfect condition that had been up for a week and nobody has taken it yet. We thought that there was maybe something wrong with it that could only be noticed when viewing the sofa in person, and it was probably hidden during the pictures. It was a weekend and we had no plan so we decided that we would go and check out the sofa. My friend contacted the seller back and organized a time and place to meet up. They decided on a local McDonald's car park at 9pm, as the seller said that he wasn't working until 8pm and he would need time to get ready after work. The seller said that he would be driving a green Honda Accord with the trailer. So we pulled up to the McDonald's car park at about 8.50pm. There were loads of people around so we had no reason to think that we would be in danger or anything. At about 8.55 my friend got a text saying that the seller was about 15 minutes away and they asked him to describe what vehicle we were in. So, he described the van that we were into him. About five minutes after he had texted the seller what vehicle we were in, 
An overweight man around 50 years old with a gray scruffy beard and greasy hair approached the driver's side window of the van, which was my side and I was driving the van. He was wearing a plain white t-shirt with looked like food stains all over it, with black jeans with holes torn in them and dried mud stains all over them, along with a pair of black steel toe cap boots also covered in dried mud. He knocked on my window so I rolled it down a bit. You boys here for the sofa, he said in a gravelly voice. It sounded like he needed to cough, but he couldn't get it out. Uh, yeah, I said to him. Rob's car is broken down just on the road, and his phone batteries died. I was with him, and I walked up to get you guys. He's with the car waiting for AA, but you can come down and collect the sofa off of him. Me and my friend looked at each other unsure of what to think. Can I get in the van and we'll go back to Rob together? The guy asked. How far down the road is he? I asked before he replied. No, oh, not too far, but I need to show you where to go. At this stage, my friend pretended to get a phone call. Hello? Yes. Ah, oh, no way, really. We'll be right there. He said before pretending to hang up his phone. He looked at me and said, Hey, we gotta go. My dad needs us to help him with his flat tire. I nodded knowing that it was a fake call for us to get the heck away from this creepy guy. Hey, we gotta go now, but we'll contact you tomorrow about the sofa. The guy just stared at us as I rolled up my window and started to drive away. Me and my friend looked at each other. That was creepy. I got bad vibes off that guy. My friend said. Definitely. I replied to him. We decided to drive around the back of the car park to see if we could find out if the guy was up to something or not. We could see him standing in the same spot where we had left him, and he was on the phone. He put his phone down and about two minutes after that, a car pulled up with three men in it and he got in. My friend's phone started ringing, and it was the number of Rob, the guy who was supposedly giving away the sofa. He answered, Hey, can you meet tomorrow? I can hold on to the sofa for you until then. As he was on the phone, I noticed one of the men in the car that had collected the creepy guy was also on the phone. My friend told Rob that he would contact him tomorrow, and that he was busy and he couldn't talk right now. At the same time that my friend hung up the phone, the guy who was in the car also finished his phone call. At this point, I explained that to my friend that there was probably no car that had broken down. And that creepy guy was trying to lure us somewhere, so the guys in the car could do god knows what to us. We drove home and my friends blocked the number of Rob, and we never heard from them again. We reported the ad and it was removed the next day. About two years ago, I moved into a new apartment. The walls were very thin and because of the fire safety laws in my city, my bedroom had one window which led into the living room, and none with outside access. The window will be important later. It was three bedrooms, one for me, one for the master tenant, and one spare, which at the time was rented out to a pretty friendly guy. Well, a friendly guy had issues with his work visa, and had to move back to Canada last minute, leaving us about two weeks to find another roommate. Our quickest and easiest option was Craigslist. Did my work schedule, I had no part in the selection process, but was content when the new roommate moved in a little bit later. He seemed a bit off, but friendly. He was a very tall, large guy, but pretty quiet. And not someone that I wanted to go out of my way to hang with, but was okay to be around and be cordial with. About two weeks into his move-in, the master tenant left for Hawaii leaving him and I alone in the home for the month-long duration of his stay. For the first few days, things were normal. All of a sudden, about four days into the trip, I'm woken up at about 8 a.m. to a frantic knocking at my door. Roommate, we'll call him Kyle, is standing there when I open it, looking frazzled. He looks me dead in the eye and says, So, do you want to tell me about what happened last night? To which I was shot and confused, 
because I had come home from work at about 9pm and immediately showered and went to bed. I explain this to him and he tells me that he heard me screaming and arguing with someone in my room and that he saw me in the side alley of the window arguing with our landlord, whom I had never even seen at that point, and that he heard people coming in and out of our house. I tell him no way, none of that ever happened. After staring at me for a little longer, he leaves and he doesn't bring it up again. And the next morning I wake up to the same thing. This time he says that he saw me arguing with my boyfriend. I was single at the time. He had seen me talking with our other roommate, who's in Hawaii, and asked me for a badge number of the officer that I had spoken to, since he had apparently seen me talking to a bunch of police as well. This time, I get angry and more or less tell him to cut this out, because I'm not doing anything and I don't know what he's talking about. He gets a weird look on his face and says, I think I had a seizure in my sleep. The next time it happens, I'll call an ambulance. And then he leaves for a bit, only to start knocking again about an hour later. Then when I open up, Kyle repeats the exact same story verbatim. This happens once more before I tell him to leave me the heck alone and I leave for work. I go to work as normal, and I am reluctant to return that night but I am too tired to switch to an alternate location. A big mistake. About 1am, I wake up to slamming doors. Kyle is pacing back and forth in his bedroom, the living room and out the front door. Walking in and out of each room, turning the lights on and off, mumbling angrily and slamming the doors. I see his figure pacing back and forth through the frosted window of my room that leads to the living room. Since my room is dark, he cannot see inside. Suddenly he screams, I can't live like this. Why are you doing this to me? I think he's on the phone and I don't respond. A few minutes later, he screams my name repeatedly and I realize that he's directing it towards me. I knew that I had to get the heck out of there. So I very quietly creep out of bed and start getting dressed and packing a bag of clothes for work in the morning. I'm almost done when he screams, I hear you, and he charges over to my room slapping the wall next to my door but not touching the door itself. I look towards my window and see his shadow lean all the way forward, pressing his ear against the glass. I was terrified and I sat completely still, unmoving. He eventually screams my name again and moves away from the window, and I hear him start pacing between rooms again. Now, my shoes are kept on a rack outside of my door, and not inside my room. So I know that when I leave, I'm going to need to take a moment to put them on. I decide to wait until his pacing takes him out of the front door again, at which the time I plan to grab my shoes, put them on, and run. As I'm formulating this plan, the pacing stops. He screams, Do you want to fight about this? Come out right now and we'll fight, I swear to God. I'm a very small, five foot girl and this guy is easily three times my size so I'm definitely not looking for a fight, thanks. After a few minutes, he turns off all the lights, and I hear the door to his room open and close, followed by silence. I wait for a moment to be sure that I can't hear any movement, and then decide to take my chance. I took a breath and I pulled my door open quickly. I step out and I grab my shoes before I look up a second later, and see him standing shirtless, with just a pair of boxers and socks on, in the dark of the hallway. His arms hung slightly outward in an awkward position. He says in a low, calm voice, Ma'am, we need to talk. This was a hard no for me, so I grab my shoes and I run at the door with them in hand. I run about half a block barefoot before I stop to put them on. When I look back, he's standing in the porch light of our front door, watching me run but not moving. Luckily, I had a friend who lived two blocks away and I had their spare key, so I let myself in and I crashed there for the night. And that's where I stayed for the next week or so while we worked things out with the master tenant, and Kyle agreed to move out within the week. 
He said he doesn't remember anything that happened, or wasn't sure if it was real or not. But if I said that's what went down, then it must be real. The day that Kyle left, he sent me a photo of the house key sitting on the table and says, I'm out, nothing else. Might take a friend over there with me to scout it out and to ensure that he actually did leave. When we get there, we discover that not only had he left a ton of food and furniture, but he had ripped all the fire alarms out of the ceilings. He had unscrewed and removed the deadbolt to the front door, and left them lined up neatly on the front table. We then realized that my front door can only lock by using a key from the outside, and it had been locked when we had arrived, meaning Kyle still had a key. We called a locksmith immediately. Even after changing the locks, I was still terrified to stay there alone afterwards, and I never went to sleep at night without barricading the doors with chairs and other furniture. To this day, I still fear for his safety. He was obviously psychologically unstable, but also wonder what could have happened if I hadn't been as lucky as I was. When I was 21, I transferred to a college in San Francisco. I checked out our room for rent on Craigslist. It was in a really nice two-bedroom apartment. It was cheap rent and close to campus, so it was the ideal spot. The girl who lived there was 29 and her name was Beth. She was tall and wide and had jet black hair and wore pale makeup. She seemed nice, although a little quiet but she seemed to like me and agreed to let me move in. So far, so good. My first night there, we went out for pizza, and that's when I could tell that something was a little bit off with her. Throughout dinner, she kept telling me how much I looked like Shia LaBeouf. I didn't know what to say, so I shrugged it off with a, thanks? I mean, I looked nothing like Shia LaBeouf, so it just didn't make any sense to me. When we got back home, she asked if I had seen her room yet, I said no, and so she took me to see it. Her walls were covered in posters of Shia LaBeouf. She even had printed out photos of him all over her mirror. She owned all of his movies. I didn't know what to make of it. It was creepy. The whole night, she had been saying that I looked like him, and now it's obvious to me that she's obsessed with the guy. A few weeks passed, and I never really saw her that much. We didn't spend any time together, really. She would come home from work and practically run to her room. She would spend the whole night in there. She had this creepy, high-pitched giggle, and I would hear her giggling through the walls all night. I wondered what the heck she could possibly be doing. Occasionally, she would come out and talk for like two minutes, and she would always be slurring her words, so I suspected that she was drinking a lot. Sometimes she wouldn't say anything and she would just stand in the hallway and watch me in the living room. I would turn and see her and be surprised and say, Hello Beth. And then there would be this long, awkward pause and she would give out her creepy, high-pitched giggle. It was a little uncomfortable being around her. She gave me the chills. One night, I woke up at around 2am because I heard what sounded like the front door being unlocked. I came out of my bedroom and all the lights were off, but I could still see Beth standing at the front door. She had her face against it, and she was turning the lock back and forth over and over again. And every time she turned the bolt, she mumbled my name. Max Barker. Max Barker. Max Barker. Seeing her standing in the dark and mumbling my name really freaked me out. And it doesn't help that she kind of looked like a bigger version of the girl from The Ring. I just quietly went back to my room and I tried to sleep. One night, I was watching Gladiator and she stumbled out of her room and turned on the living room light, forcing me to pause the movie, which was annoying. She then asked me if I wanted to hear about her ex-boyfriend. It was an uneasy segue into the topic, but I just said sure and then awkwardly sat back to listen to her. Ten minutes into her story and she was so riled up. She was screaming at the top of her lungs about their breakup. I was worried that the neighbors were going to call the cops, 
and she wasn't listening to me when I was asking her to lower the volume. Amidst all of her screaming, one thing she said really freaked me out. She was in such a fit and yelled, I'll freaking end his life. That was a big game changer. Suddenly, I had no idea what this girl was capable of. She was practically a stranger and everything I had seen was becoming alarmingly disturbing. After a few more minutes, she told me thanks for listening, and she started doing her giggle. I got out of there pretty fast and went to my room to go to sleep. I had a pretty unsettled feeling about being in the house with her, and what's worse is that there was no lock on my bedroom door. I pushed the edge of my dresser in front of it to act as a little barricade. Later on, I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of my dresser scraping against the floor. Beth was trying to push the door open. I turned on my light, shouting at her to stop. I could see her through the opening of the door. She was so drunk and had this insane look in her eyes. I pushed the door closed and yelled at her to go to bed. I could hear her walk back to her room, but I couldn't fall back asleep. The next morning, when I went out into the hallway, my heart dropped. I saw one of her steak knives was on the floor by my door. I got goosebumps all over my arms. All I could think about was her saying what she would do to her ex-boyfriend. I confronted her about it, and she said that she didn't remember trying to push my door open. She said that she didn't even remember telling me about her ex. I had had enough. My lease was month to month, so I found a new spot and I moved out. About a month after I moved out, she contacted me. I was at the movies and my phone was off. When I got out, I turned my phone on. And to my shock, I had received more than 40 text messages that she had sent to me over the past two hours. They were all just crazy texts that ranged from everything between Hi, how are you? And I freaking hate you. It was insane. I didn't respond and I never heard from her again. I always wonder if I hadn't set my dresser in front of my door. Would she have quietly come into my room and done the unspeakable? It freaks me out. I was on a hitchhiking adventure from BC, Canada to Antigua, Guatemala, which started in September 2019. This post is taken from the notes in my journal, which I wrote as soon as I could after this insane experience. If you've ever hitchhiked before, you know how amazing it is and how many cool people you can meet. Out of thousands of rides across 40 countries, I've only had two bad and or dangerous encounters at thumbing it. This was my second one. I was taking a break from traveling to find weed trim work in California's Nevada City, a beautiful little town with a very interesting crowd. We got stuck a few towns over for not getting a ride all day. I ended up sleeping a night at the Love's gas station, which I had done plenty of times before. I've slept in worse places. At least Love's has a bathroom. In the morning, I was a little more desperate to accept rides because no one was stopping and it had already been a whole day. I just wanted to get out of there. A pickup truck is speeding past me and slams the brakes ahead and then slowly backs up. Inside is a man and a woman in their late 50s and he says in a husky voice, Where are you headed, boy? Nevada City. Any distance helps. We'll get in. We're going to Yuba. They seemed normal enough, even without most of their teeth and hair. So I jumped in. It all happened in rapid succession. I toss my bag in the back and jump in. I shut the door. I notice a pile of guns and bullets on the floor. Before I have time to rethink my decision, we speed off. So as I'm trying to assess whether or not I'm in danger, they start telling me how this guy just got out of jail for aggravated assault. How he beat some guy so bad that he can't even think straight no more. And they both started to laugh. She was holding his seatbelt over his chest, and they both smell like crap. And they start asking how much money I have. 
I think, yep, I'm not safe here. After hitchhiking all this way, I don't look very wealthy. I'm filthy, I need a shower. I look no different than the stereotypical homeless guy. So I try to seem more poor than I am, and more tough than I am too. I'm broke as heck, man. That's why I'm going to the city. I'm hoping to make some cash trimming. The man looks me in the eye. Well, you'll find it alright. You'll find it good. Don't be afraid to do no dirty work. If people try, they'll try to screw you over. So you screw them over first. You get what I'm saying? Put your eyes on the dang road. Jesus Christ. The woman points forward and he swerves back to the right lane. He asked me if I smoke, and knowing that California has legalized weed, I put two and two together, he's offering me a joint. So I say, yeah, I smoke. With a wild look in his eyes, he exclaims, great, and we turn off the highway and start down a dirt road. I'm more than worried and I look behind us. In the back of the truck is my bag, a chainsaw, a pickaxe, and a plastic tarp over something. It didn't help my anxiety. Finally, we stop out in front of a clearing. The woman takes out, not a joint, but a meth pipe. It's the first time that I've seen one, and a lot of things start to make sense. While he lights up and exhales into the car, I've never seen smoke so white. I roll down the windows because I don't want to smoke that crap. The woman takes them as well, and they tell me how they were going to collect money that a woman owes them. That dang girl is going to pay one day or another. She better have the money, or I'm going to grab her and say, Where's my money? Oh, she'll have it, all right. She'll have it, or else. You say, son, you ever steal something? Because we could make $20,000 today. I don't know exactly how to answer this guy. And he repeats, $20,000 today. Here, smoke some of this. And he hands me the pipe. Nothing like the good stuff, ain't that right? I gently reject it and say that it's not really my thing. Which he surprisingly takes well and smokes some more before putting it away and driving off back towards the highway. His driving is terrible. Swerving, speeding, hitting brakes abruptly. Men starts trying to convince me to steal some marijuana plants. You'll hold my gun and I'll hold the drill. And I'll keep lookout. Yeah, baby girl, you keep lookout now. You gotta be careful if you hear the dogs because they some son of a guns are nasty. Nasty. You see this bite. And he reviews what looks like a terrible scar on his arm. I didn't really know how to get out of the situation. So I sounded as confident as possible and said that I was meeting a friend to look for work together and that they would be expecting me today. We neared the end of Yuba City where they pull over to the side. Well, it's your funeral. You don't want to eat? Fine by me, but if you ever want that cash, you call me. Then he hands me his number. Heck no, I think. Uh, thanks, I will. Quickly retrieving my bag, smiling nervously. The woman says with a wave, Take care now, God bless. And they speed off. I'm standing on the side of the road thinking, What the heck was that? Just happy to be out of the car. I've had multiple trips. The reason was because it cost too much to always travel from town to city. I was living there for six months and I wanted to see my girlfriend at the time and had to always get hotels over the weekend to stay. So I thought that I would save some money by hitchhiking. I would never ever suggest anyone to hitchhike. One, a very nice couple picked me up and during the drive, we just talked about each other's lives. But what worried me is when the boyfriend asked his girlfriend to pass him a beer while driving. Later on in the night, they were saying that they were meeting their friends for a home dinner party and if I would like to join them. Maybe I was the dinner, I thought. 2. Two guys who just recently got out of prison picked me up. Being a guy with long hair and a ponytail didn't really help the situation either. I had a pocket knife on me but they were nice and I managed to adapt to the conversation since I had known a few rough around the edges sort of people myself. But during one of the conversations, they said, how awesome would it be to drag some chick into the woods and take turns? 
I also had to go to urinate and when they stopped on the side of the road, I got kind of worried that I was going to get attacked from behind. 3. While walking home one night, it's a long strip of nothing but bushes and I didn't want to pay for a taxi. It's about an hour and a half walk. Someone pulled up beside me with a fast looking car. Nothing fancy really. He rolls down the window and it's a young guy around my age and asked if I wanted to ride. I said sure, why not? Hope you don't mind if I go fast. Oh and also, this isn't my car. I might have borrowed or stole it off my friend. In my brain I'm just thinking, cool cool cool, in a stolen car zooming down the road, why not? Before, a more wholesome story, but not much to go on them other than a father who spoke proudly of his sons, who was making it into music, and another guy who would occasionally move a towel from the window to give his dog some shade. And for the last one, also a truck driver had picked me up once and I got to see how trucks are and the amount of space that they were behind the front seats. Overall, there's some goods and bads when you hitchhike, but still, I wouldn't recommend it. When I was growing up, my sister and I would sometimes hitchhike to get to where we wanted to go, such as the local pool and so on. Of course, this meant that we encountered our fair share of creeps, even at the ages of 12, 13, or 14. The town that we lived in was very wealthy, but we were poor and living in a rented upper floor of a duplex with our mom. I didn't know it until later, but there were a lot of bad people in that town. I know this from a first-hand experience. Since we were poor, we didn't have a car and didn't even have bikes until later. Being in such a wealthy neighborhood, there were no buses, not even school buses. So walking and hitchhiking was how we mainly got around then. There was one time when I was trying to get home that a man picked me up. Bear in mind that this guy was probably one of the local neighborhood dads, or maybe an older brother of someone, though I didn't know him. It was pretty much only families living in that suburban town. Lots of creeps there and that's not even the worst that happened. But then he passed my street and didn't even move to slow down. It appeared that he intended to keep going so I told him that A he had passed my street. He said that that was okay and he tried to grab at me. Well he did grab me for a second but I somehow got him to stop the car and got home safely. Of course I didn't tell anyone since I would have been in trouble anyway for hitchhiking. And these people likely count on this. I think I was 12 at the time. I was also followed home when I was 17 and mugged on my very own street. I'm giving this background to explain why I had some degree of self-assurance and well as stupidity in what happens next. This experience happened before cell phones and GPS. I was 23 at the time. I had just moved to Michigan from several states away to start a new job at a factory. I didn't know anything at all about the state. I arrived late on a Sunday after all the packing to move in the long drive so I just crashed in an exhausted heap in a hotel near the factory. I had to start work immediately the next morning. We had to clock in and out as I recall. Only got a 30 minute lunch and two 15 minute breaks that you also had to clock in and out for. And you got docked if you went over the time. Which was not enough to allow you to leave during the workday. We worked 12 hours a day from 7am to 7pm, and I think 8 to 4 on Sundays. It was winter then, so I arrived and left in the dark. That meant I really didn't have much of a chance to explore my new neighborhood. I just went to and from work. I didn't have any friends or relatives in the entire state either, much less where I worked. By the end of my first work week, due to having to pay for lunches and so on, I had exhausted the small amount of cash that I had. I finally got some time off the first Sunday. My car was very nearly out of gas at this point and I had no way to pay for gas without cash. I didn't even have a credit card or a gas credit card or even a local check since I hadn't been able to get to a local bank to open an account yet. I also didn't know where the nearest gas station was but figured that I would come across one because this factory was very much near a major interstate, though the area around the factory was very rural and sparsely populated. Since all I had was a department store credit card, my plan to get gas was as follows. 
I found out from people around work that there is a large mall off of an exit on the interstate, and the mall was about a 15 minute drive away. The department store that I had the credit card with was at this mall. I knew from prior experience that I would be able to cash a check there and then use the cash at a gas station. I figured that I had enough gas to make this short trip, so I headed out onto the interstate. The store closed at 5pm that day, but I had time to make it. I think the bill pay credit department where I was going to cash the check closed at 4.30, but I'm not sure. I was planning to get there by 5 and was hoping for the best, so time was a bit tight. I had covered a few miles on the interstate when I felt the car slowing and noticed that it would no longer respond to my pressing my foot on, on the gas pedal. Crap, I had run out of gas. I managed to pull onto the shoulder before the car died. I didn't have AAA, which could have brought me gas. I have it now and even if I did, I had no way to call for help. I also didn't even really know where I was other than being on the interstate between work and this mall. Also, the clock was ticking, and every minute that passed was bringing me closer to the store closing time, which was my only hope for cash and ultimately gas, maybe until the following Sunday. Crap. I was thinking about walking, but didn't see any gas stations ahead, and hadn't passed any either. A few minutes later, a car pulled up on the shoulder in front of me and asked if I needed help. The driver was a man, appearing to be in his late 30s or early 40s. Nothing about his demeanor raised any alerts at that time, but he was a stranger so I had my guard up. I told him that I ran out of gas and was going to walk to a station. Though I had no money, I didn't want him to know that I had no options. He said that there weren't any stations close by and that he would give me a ride. Eh, crap. I really really didn't want to do this but I felt that I had no choice. If it happened today, I would have just asked the person to call road service for me, but it wasn't possible. And I had experience growing up taking rides from strangers and nothing really happened. I decided that I had to do it, but that I would set apart against the passenger side door in case he tried to grab me and I would jump out if things got scary. Note that I had never heard of Ted Bundy and how he had abducted women at the time. He had removed the car door handles on the passenger side so they couldn't escape. I'm kind of glad I didn't know this. My rescuer starts driving and asking me questions as he drove. I didn't want to disclose much information, but he finds out that I just moved there and didn't really know anyone. And then he said that, You really shouldn't just get in a car with a stranger. Haven't you heard that there is a killer on the loose, and a few girls about your age have been killed? My blood ran cold, but he smiled and said that I was safe with him. Yeah, right. He exited the interstate and made a few turns. We got to a shell gas station which wasn't visible from the interstate. At this point, I had no idea where I was, how to get back to my car exactly where I was. The gas station also had a working garage that was still open. I told the guy that I would be right back and that he could wait out front which luckily he did, so I got to go in alone. I told the cashier that I needed gas and that I also needed a gas can. She said that she didn't have any to sell. I told her that actually I didn't have any money, and I was in a pinch and asked if I could borrow one. She said that she couldn't help. I went back out front and told the guy this. He said that it was okay. He lived nearby and had his own gas pump. We could just go to his house. Come on, let's go. And started walking to his car. No way. I turned around and I went into the gas station garage where I immediately noticed a couple of gas cans leaning up against the wall. I grabbed one and I took it to the pump, where I filled it up with a gallon or so of gas. I went back to the cashier and told her that I was taking the gas can and the gas. She said that I couldn't do that. And I said that yes, I was going to do this and I was going to leave my driver's license and department store credit card as collateral. And that I would be back to pay for the gas and return the can. I also told her that I was in trouble and that I didn't know this guy. That he was talking about serial killers and wanted to take me to his house. And she had to let me take the gas and the can and I wasn't leaving without it. 
Uh, I put my driver's license and credit card down on the counter and assured her that I would be back. And then I had to get back in this guy's car and hope that he would take me back instead of off to some field to take care of me. And I know that he also knew that the gas station had my ID. So I assumed that if I didn't return with the can, they might recall that I was there with this guy. I thought that this might provide some measure of protection. Luckily, he did take me back to my car. He then asked me for the car keys. I really didn't want to give them to him. There was no reason for him to at all for them, and he also took the gas can from me and poured the gas into the tank. I didn't want him to take the can from me either, but was still hoping that maybe things would turn out okay if I just kept acting like all of this was normal. He then told me to pop the hood and that he would check the engine. I held my hand out for the keys and luckily he gave them back. I didn't know what he was going to do once he had access to the engine. Remove the distributor cap. Remove the spark plugs wires. Unhook the battery. It didn't make sense to me that he needed to look under the hood when I knew I was just out of gas. He told me to try to start the car and I did. And then when he told me to pop the hood, it only opened a bit until the latch caught it. Since you still had to use the manual release from the front of the car to get the hood fully open. And as he was walking along the side of the car towards the front to finish opening the HUD, my accelerated off of the HUD is still partially open. I heard him yell and assume that he went back to his car but didn't see him again. I found my way back to the gas station and returned the empty gas can. I picked up my license and credit card and got the department store in time where I cashed the largest check they allowed. I tried to never run out of gas again and now study maps before I venture out somewhere new even though I now have GPS. Maybe this guy was just trying to help. Maybe he was a concerned dad who saw a girl in trouble and there was nothing more to it. There's a high probability of this. Most people in Michigan are really nice and helpful, but they have had their fair share of killers too. But what if he was just trying to help? And then why tell me about serial killers and try to get me to go to his house? I don't know, but I'm glad I never found out. Okay, so let me start this off with a little bit of context. I live in Trinidad, so I might use some un-American terminology in this. I'm a girl and I was 15 when I was in 11th grade. Fifth form, because I had skipped a year in primary school, so I was a year younger than most of the other kids in my class. When I was in that grade, I was not exactly the most healthy or athletic person, but I generally enjoyed PE class and I liked to run around in the gym and play games and such. So when I had to pick courses for semester one of grade 11, I made sure to pick PE just like I had done for grades at 9 and 10. I was a little shocked when I got to the first day of PE, and I found out that our old PE teacher had gone back to Canada because his work term here was over. He had been with my school for four years, so it was understandable when someone told me that he hadn't gotten fired. So we meet our new PE teacher. He looks to be around 30-something, with light skin and blue eyes and blonde hair that was shaved on the sides and styled but short on top. A lot of girls immediately liked him and said that he was handsome, but I didn't see it because I wasn't interested in boys or men. This PE teacher liked to take us on walks and runs so we would leave school at lunchtime in a bus and come back as school was ending, since PE was last period. One time we went to a place that was known for its holler monkeys, it was a paved path through the forest, and it went up and around a hill. We started walking, PE teacher in the back. When we reached as far as we could go in the time that we had, we turned around and started going back down the trail. I was slow and not very fit, so I was in the back with my teacher. The whole way down, we were talking about what we knew about the holler monkeys and the animals in general. I was an animal nerd growing up, so I had a bit of things to talk about. I was so happy to get to talk to an adult and have them take me seriously. I know it's kind of dumb, 
but I am the oldest grandchild to a very traditional Chinese grandfather, and I'm a girl so not a son like he wanted. He pushed me hard to get good grades and never really wanted to talk to me, and my parents were always working, so I just wanted a grown up to actually listen to what I had to say. On the bus ride back, I sat in front of the bus so we could continue talking. I only got more attached to him when he would let me talk his ear off about whatever I was obsessed with at the time, which was usually some comic book, TV show, or movie. I think at the time it was either Transformers or Pokemon, but whatever it was, he let me actually talk about it. I didn't see anything wrong with that at the time. I was always in the back of the groups during our walks, and so was he. I figured that we might as well chat. He liked to touch my hair sometimes, but I was used to that because my hair was so long that it went past my butt. After a few days of just walking and going places to do jogs, we played field hockey. We did it with two teams and our teacher playing as just someone who would pick teams as he played. So he was kind of like a third team all on his own. He would help the losing team score points. And I don't think that it was a coincidence that the losing team was mine, seeing how non-athletic I am. It was during this game that other girls started to see something wrong with the way our teacher played. He would pat girls on their butts with his hockey stick in order to get them to jump or get startled, leaving the ball open for him to steal. The girls later were complaining that what he was doing was gross and wrong, but I said that I didn't see anything wrong with it. It took me time to realize that he really shouldn't have been doing that. The realization coming when he started to use his hand to pinch the girl's butts instead of tapping them with a the hockey stick. Next thing I knew, the dude was fired. He didn't quit, he was fired. One of the girls must have told the principal or something, but I know that it wasn't me. I was actually so upset when he wasn't there anymore. And looking back on that and knowing that I felt that way it makes me feel disgusting. So to my 11th grade a PE teacher, please let's not meet again. Hi, and for the record, I'm a female. I'm turning 19 this year and the story happened when I was 15. Oh, and also I'm from France, so it can explain my English mistakes if there are any. When I was 15 years old, I just got into my junior year. I created my first Twitter account that I deleted because of this story. Some information. I didn't tell anyone my username, neither my family nor my friends because I didn't have any. My profile picture was an avatar, so no pictures of me on the account. And as a location, I said Paris because I lived in the suburbs. I didn't have any followers. 20 or maybe 30, and I didn't follow that many people, so my TL was not really interesting. One evening in October, someone sent me quite a strange direct message. It was from a 200 followers account, and the message was, Hey, my name's Rob. I just turned 17 and wanted to know if you lived in blank because I will soon move and go to the town high school and I'm looking for friends. Blank was obviously the town that I lived in. I immediately thought something was wrong because there was nowhere on my profile that said where I actually lived. But after some time thinking, I remembered a tweet I made weeks ago about buses and I mentioned the city so I told myself that he just searched the town name and found my tweet. His age wasn't shocking because I'm two years ahead of my classmates. I was bored and he was polite, and I answered him. I told him that I did indeed live in this town, and I went to high school there. The discussion was natural, and we talked a lot that night, mainly about high school, about the food at the cafeteria, about the teachers, that kind of thing. But as it was getting very late, he tried to interpose some personal questions like, Do you live far away from the school? In a house or in an apartment, do you live with both your parents? There's five of you. You're not often home alone, right? 
I never answered because it was way too shady for me, and unfortunately, he didn't insist. Unfortunately, because if he did, I would have probably blocked him. The next day, same thing. We talked a lot, and he was still asking personal questions to get to know me better, and so I asked him too, and he always answered with what seemed like honesty. I still didn't answer the questions about my house, though, because he didn't need to know anything. It lasted two or three weeks, but it was enough for me to develop feelings for him. He was handsome, super kind, and it was everything that I needed. Because I was bullied for years and even today, I still develop strong feelings, but most importantly, blindly trust people who are friendly to me. In France, in October, we had a two-week-long vacation, and the day before back-to-school day, he finally told me that he was coming to my high school because he had finally moved in with his mom, and he asked me a place to meet during the morning break. I was so happy and relieved to be able to finally meet him, and I told him to join me in the hallway. But when he understood that there would be people around, he said that he would prefer an isolated place because he was afraid he would not recognize me and didn't want to spend the whole break looking around for me. It was a good excuse for me, so I told him to meet me in the third floor bathroom because we weren't allowed to stay there during the breaks and no one would disturb us. In my head, even though it was a little bit creepy, I was still in the school so nothing could happen to me. Next day, back to school day, I made myself pretty. I wore my best clothes and I counted down the minutes and finally, when break time arrived, I ran to the bathroom and waited. And when he arrived, it was him. He was not a catfish and he looked quite like his profile picture. But I noticed that he seemed a little bit older than he told me. I thought 20 years old instead of 17. We talked a lot, we got along well. I was so pleased and at the end of break, he asked me to go with him to the fast food place for lunch. I said no because I didn't have any money, and I always refused for people to pay for me. It's a principle. He seemed disappointed but offered to walk me home after classes. I explained that I have to take the bus, but that he could walk me to the bus stop. He looked disappointed again, but finally accepted. And that's exactly what happened. And it was so great that it quickly became some kind of routine. We met in the third floor bathroom during the morning break, and he walked me to the bus stop after classes. A surprising fact, I never saw him in the hallways nor at the cafeteria. But I thought at the time that the building was huge and that there were over 1,500 students in there. So if our schedules didn't coincide, there was no way that we could meet each other. This little game lasted until December, so almost a month and a half. The 14th of December, a Thursday, I complained about how lonely I was going to be that evening because my dad was abroad for work. My brother was always at his friend's house. My little sis was on a school trip and my mom had to work late that very night. It was very reckless of me, but after weeks, I thought that I could trust him. That evening, he walked me to the bus stop. We both waited. I got in the bus and waved at him and put on my earphones. I had two stops before my house. It was about 5.45 in December, so it was already really dark outside. And as I got out of the bus, I had a really bad feeling. There was that very uncomfortable sensation in my stomach, and I felt like being observed. I pressed pause on my music, but kept my earphones in, so that people thought I couldn't hear anything. And that's probably what saved my life. I lived in a suburban neighborhood, very silent, especially at night, with no visibility on the big road the bus passed in. When I heard footsteps behind me, I understood that I was right. There was someone following me, and he was not well-intentioned. At least I could hear that he was not accelerating, so he wasn't trying to catch up to me. But I couldn't guess how long it would last. As quietly as possible, I tried to reach for my keys in my pocket, and when I finally pulled them out, I ran. I ran as fast as I could, 
the best sprint of my life. I don't know how it worked, but I managed to open and close the door before he could reach me. I then deactivated my alarm, which by the way confirmed that I was home alone, and took a look through the glass panel on the door. It's not a peephole, it's a whole window, so if somebody wanted to see what's happening inside, they could. It was Rob, a few meters away looking at me with a really creepy face. He followed me to my home, probably with a car, and he was clearly not here for chit chat. I still don't know why I didn't call the police. I was totally paralyzed. We both stared at each other for a minute, and when I took back control over my body, I ran in the kitchen and I got a knife, and I got back to the door. He was there too, banging against the door. I feared for a second that the glass would break, but it didn't happen. That moment when I was pushing against the door, praying for it not to break while he was kicking harder and harder, was the longest that I have ever experienced. After maybe five minutes, he stopped and got around the house and knocking against every shutter, and he got to the back door. He looked very angry, but then my neighbor's car reached my house and Rob ran away, probably thinking that it was my mom coming home. On Twitter, Rob sent me a thousand DMs before I could block him. He then deleted his account, and I thought that I was done with the story. But quickly after, some accounts which have just been created followed me. Their ad names were all a series of numbers in the first letter of his name, and as soon as I blocked one, another one followed me. I chose to delete my account because I couldn't make it stop, and it was too much to endure because they were sending me dozens of insulting DMs. Later, I talked to the people who were supposed to be Rob's classmates, because I haven't met him again in days, but not a single one ever heard about Rob. This guy was never a student in my high school. That's why I never met him apart from our daily meetings. That's probably why he seems so old. I never heard about him again anymore, and I'm still asking myself what did he want and what could have happened that night. The first year of middle school, a lot of things happened that I believe really shouldn't have. About a month before school started, a day before my birthday, I got my period for the first time. I had called my friend a few days afterwards to tell her. I was a bit of an early bloomer, so I was one of the first in my friend group to start. Well, later on this particular friend of mine and I got into a fight, and her retaliation was to start a rumor about me around the school that I was pregnant and had sex with a high schooler. Throughout the day, I noticed people giving me weird looks, and I had no idea what it was about until my friends told me. I came home bawling my eyes out and my sister knew why. Being in a small town, rumors spread like wildfire, and everybody already knew about it. This girl at the high school my sister was at told her about it, and she went off on her. And this started a whole chain of events. Me crying, figuring out who it was. And my mom at the principals not leaving until they promised to do something about it. It slowly started to get better. But walking home from school, I lived nearly across the street, became a hell. I never learned the guy's name. But the first day he followed me around on his bike with his best friend. They circled around me so I had to stop walking asked me personal questions, which I'd either stay silent or say something snappy, or just a bunch of things to purposefully make me uncomfortable. On the third day, he kept making sexual comments about me to the point even his friend said, too far man. After that, he never had his friend with him. I just kind of broke down a few days after it happening. I was always a really shy, quiet kid. I spent most of elementary school not talking. I had no idea how to handle it, and I was scared to ask for help, because I didn't think anybody would believe me or not take it seriously, so I simply just didn't say anything. The last day of it happening I think was the worst. He had a group of girls behind him all cheering him on as he harassed me. One of them laughed and said, You should stalk her and he actually agreed with her. 
I finally had had enough and I started screaming and cussing him out. He smirked and said, Feisty, I like it. I just ran home. I was already at the halfway point. My sister was waiting for me at the front door that day with our dog, only a few months old, so she had heard the whole thing. She didn't do that often, but it seemed like perfect timing. She looked panicked and was just like, Are you okay? Do I need to hurt someone? And told me that I need to report that to the school. I said that I was fine and that it's taken care of. She was reluctant, but I let it go. He walked past my house and our dog jumped in front of him and started growling at him. He just chuckled, which freaked both me and my sister out. A few months before our house had gotten broken into, and because I was home alone a lot, my mom decided that I needed a dog to protect me. She is a sweetheart though, and lets people pet her and everything. And that's why my sister would sometimes wait for me outside and let kids pet her. He was one of the only people that she's ever growled at. I'm really afraid that if I didn't stand up for myself or had a dog, that he would have followed up on the threat of stalking me. I only saw him around school a couple times. Once on the student news because he was on the football team and got this award. I almost started crying when I saw that. And then he went up to my lunch table because my friend asked him a question. And he stared at me the entire time. The last time I saw him was the last day of school. I was getting things out of my locker and when I walked past him, his breath hitched and he just looked at me the entire time that I was in the hallway. There's a lot of reasons I hate that Tom, but after I graduated from 8th grade, he was the biggest reason why I didn't want to go to that high school there. I'm glad my mom accepted and we moved into the city. I've had to deal with my fair share of creeps, but he was by far the worst of them all. So, it's taken me a while to decide to write all of this down because this story has multiple parts that may or may not be connected. It might be a long one and a little anticlimactic, as it's not as creepy or traumatic as some other stories. But it's taken weeks for me to get a good night's sleep since Ronald Simmons came banging at my door. Here's the setup. I live on a little dirt road in southern Ohio. Which sounds rural and farmy, but it sits right up against a complex of subsidized apartments and a major thoroughfare for the area. It's a weird mix of transients and longtime residents, young families and lone elderly people. One house might be meticulously kept and maintained, but then the neighbor might have a jet ski in the yard and a tree wrapped in chicken wire as a makeshift cage for their pet parrot. Not a random example, it's a real thing. I've lived here for nearly 10 years, and for more than 9 of those years, it's just been my daughter and I. She's 10 now, but I still don't like to let her play alone in the yard, and I'm obsessed about keeping our doors closed and deadbolted at all times, even when we're just chilling at home. I keep to myself and don't ask questions or cause problems. I'm an introvert whose primary goal in life is to leave and be left alone. And then Tom moved in. So imagine that the neighborhood is kind of laid out like a four-rung ladder. I live on the third rung and going left to right, it takes you to a road that leads to the aforementioned main thoroughfare and exits the neighborhood. Tom moves into a house near one of these exit roads, just a few houses down from me on the opposite side of the street, which I was wholly unaware of until I was out to my yard one day a few years ago and a passing car slowed and the window rolled down. Now, I've had sketchy experiences with scammers and solicitors in the neighborhood before. There's a whole story about a group that tried to convince me to get in their car and take money out of the ATM for them. So I'm highly skeptical and suspicious of any strangers that wanted to stop for a chat. Plus, I had never seen this guy before. Heavy set, salt and pepper hair heavy lidded eyes and probably in his 50s at least. I was 26 at the time, so he had to be around twice my age. So Tom slows the car and rolls down the passenger window, 
Me says something, but I can't hear him, so I take a hesitant step closer to the vehicle, hoping that he's just asking for directions. May hey girl, he says, and all my hackles immediately go up, at the positively greasy way he says the word, girl. I'm Tom, just moved in down the street there. Oh, I tell him, off my footing. Okay. What's your name, honey? Now, calling me honey is usually a great way to make me upset, but there was something about him, even in those first few moments that set off alarm bells. Sometimes, it's not a big deal to tell a creep to screw off, but other times, there's a voice that goes, this one is a time bomb, do not set him off. And so I tell him my name in the hope that he's just being neighborly because, hey, Maybe he's a nice grandpa who hasn't gotten the memo about using girl and honey. It's southern Appalachia. He wouldn't be the only one. But then... You got a boyfriend? I think every woman probably has that little oh god moment every time this question gets asked by a random. I'm so taken aback and still trying to feel out the interaction that I just say something in the negative because it's true. I don't have a boyfriend. For a good reason, I'm gay, but at this point in my life, that's still very private information, and I don't feel obligated or inclined to provide that detail to him. You should let me take you out sometime, he says. We can have a few beers. At this point, all of my skin is crawling and I decline as politely as I can. He persists and the interaction feels like it takes a lifetime. But I'm guessing it's about 10 or 15 minutes because I successfully inch my way back to my front door and make an excuse to go back inside. I was hoping that, that would be the last time that I would have to talk to Tom, but of course it wasn't. For weeks, it seemed like every time that I stepped outside, there was Tom in his car, slowing down to talk to me about this or that, but mostly trying to convince me to go out with him. When are we going to go to dinner? I always said no as politely as I could. It was annoying and stressful, but manageable. And then it escalated. I'm sitting at home one day and there's a knock at my door. I don't have a peephole or any means of knowing who's at my door without sticking my whole dang head out of my front window. So mostly, I just don't answer the door unless I'm expecting someone. If it's someone that I know, they'll call me on my phone or announce themselves at the door. So, I just let the knocking go. And then my doorbell rings. And then there's more knocking and more knocking and more freaking knocking. And so finally, I'm like, maybe the neighbor's house is on fire or something. I don't know. I answer the door and, of course, it's Tom. Hey, girl. He says with a slick, ominous grin that never reaches his eyes. How you doing? I want to tell him to go screw himself, but not more than ever. My instincts are telling me not to make him angry. He's clearly not afraid to push a boundary, and he lives basically just two or three houses down. All I can imagine is him going home and stewing over my insults, my rejection, and then only having to walk like two minutes to get back at me. So I make the conversation as short as possible, decline all of his advances as politely as possible, and deadbolt my door as quickly as possible once he's gone. He starts coming around at least once a day, and I stop answering the door. He persists with his knocking, pounding loudly and angrily on the door when I won't answer. But I am not going to voluntarily engage with this dude in any way. One day, I'm sitting in my living room floor working on something and the knocking starts. I ignore it. It gets more insistent and angry. He calls my name, but he can't prove that I'm home, so screw him. And then, and then, he tries the handle on my door. I always deadbolt the door, thank God. But the actual door handle is usually a lot. So I was sitting right there, not three feet from the door. When I saw and heard it turn violently, if it hadn't have been deadbolted, he would have walked right in and found me sitting on the floor. 
I probably should have called the police, but I had never called the cops on anyone before. It seemed so extreme. He went away shortly after and I just let it go. So stupid. On another day, I'm out mowing my lawn, headphones in. When I look up, here comes Tom. I can't get away from this dude and it starts making me feel absolutely trapped. Of course he wants to talk, and because I'm a non-confrontational moron at the time, I stop mowing and I pull out my headphones. He tells me that he can help me with the mowing. A pretty girl like me shouldn't have to mow her own yard. All I gotta do is come down and ask him. He tells me how he helps out Eric all the time. Eric lives two houses down from me, almost directly across from Tom. And Eric is a constant, habitual, public drunk. He doesn't bother anyone, just staggers around his yard, hangs out on the couch in his driveway, and feeds these stray cats. Which is problematic because it means we have a booming population of feral, half-mad cats running amok. But I feel for him. I'm an animal person, so I get it. I've seen Tom and Eric together sometimes, and I guess that they're friends. Tom says that he mows Eric's grass and that he can mow mine too. But I've never seen Tom mow anything. And besides, like, holy crap, man, just leave me alone. He goes on to say that he sees me driving by his house sometimes. Yeah, there's only two ways off the street, and the shorter route is past his house. So I have, by default, driven past his house. But I won't anymore. Never again. I'll take the long way if it kills me. I decline his help, and I decline and decline and decline. I start avoiding being outside at all costs. I usher my daughter as quickly as I can to and from the car. I carry groceries in as quickly as possible. But even then, he can see me from his house. And as I'm rushing towards the door, I will sometimes hear a loud, low wolf whistle. And I look up to see Tom waving at me. I usually pretend that I don't see him or hear him, and I deadbolt the door as quickly as I can. At some point in the following days or weeks, I order a pizza. When there's a knock at the door, I answer it immediately. For a bewildering second, I can't figure out why my pizza man is shirtless. But it's not my pizza man. It's Tom and his enormous bear beer gut. He's swaying a little bit and he leans in against my door frame. He pushes a piece of paper into my hand and explains that this is his phone number. He asks again if I've got a boyfriend yet. At this point, I'm desperate and I feel like it's a bad idea to just blurt out that I'm a lesbian Tom. For one, I feel like this won't deter him in fact. I feel like it might just make him upset and make me a target for something even worse. In fact, it might make me a target with the whole neighborhood. Which sounds extreme, but the first year that I lived here, a guy was beaten to death just up the street. He wasn't gay, and it's a longer story. But I've always stayed aware that violence wasn't an impossibility. Plus, I don't have a girlfriend either. It's just me and my daughter all the time. I just needed this guy to leave me alone. I've never met someone who was so completely put me on edge. I kept thinking how easy it would be for him to just push past me into the house. I could see him doing it to my head. There is a constant feeling that he was just on the edge of moving, of pouncing. So I just lie to him and say that, yes, I have a boyfriend and that we're very happy. Thank you so much, hetero bliss. He grins that dark, greasy grin and he says, I ain't seen no man around here. He's watching me in my house, watching who comes and goes. This and the fact that he's actually trying to challenge my lie makes my blood go cold. It's like it's a game for him. Because he doesn't say it angrily, he says it like it's cute. Like he's caught me against a wall. Like, like I'm prey. And he knows that I'm defenseless. I mean, I'm not defenseless. Even as I'm imagining him pushing his way into the house, I'm also imagining what I can use as a weapon, planning to go straight for his eyes, his nose, the growing. I wouldn't go down without a fight, that's for sure. 
But I make up something stupid, like how my pretend boyfriend is in the military, and that he's away right now, but we're very happy, and no, I didn't want to have any beer you're carrying with you for some reason. He launches into a litany of questions about my pretend soldier boyfriend. How many trucks does he have? Is he good looking? Do I think that Tom is good looking? Does he take care of me the way Tom could take care of me? Is Tom good looking? Tom has two trucks, you know. He could take care of me. Is my boyfriend a black guy? The last question shuts me down entirely and somehow makes me both scared and more upset. I already know that he's a creepy piece of crap, but now he's a racist, a creepy piece of crap. This guy just keeps getting worse and worse. I rebuke him again and tell him that I have to go. He says, Well, what your boyfriend don't know won't hurt him. I make him leave. He comes around periodically for a few more years, leaves some gifts at my door at some point, an old doll and some kind of toys from his garage. I think that they were for my daughter, but I just threw them away. It seems to go on forever, and I debate calling the cops. I keep thinking that he's just right down the road, and if I call the cops, it's going to become a whole thing. It might escalate more. What are the cops going to do? They can't be there every day, and he hasn't even done anything criminal yet. I don't have a leg to stand on. But eventually, gradually, he leaves me alone. Thank God, I think he got a girlfriend, maybe. I don't know. The whole thing has taken place over the last 4 or 5 years, but the last several months, maybe 12 or 18 months or so, have been very quiet. And I can only assume that he had moved away, or had gotten the message or all the above. I barely even see him. Cut to about 3 weeks ago. I am sitting on my couch late in the evening around 10 o'clock, when I hear a noise out on the sidewalk. I pause and listen and then someone turns my doorknob. It's deadbolted like always, thankfully. I'm alarmed now and the banging at my door starts. I can't see who it is, but I know that I'm not expecting any visitors. The banging turns frantic, urgent, but I wait. More knocking and knocking and knocking. I think that maybe it's my parents. Maybe something has happened to my dad. He had a history of heart problems. But why wouldn't they call? Why wouldn't they right now just call out and announce who they are? And then I hear a low, male voice say, Man, screw this. Oh God. More knocking and turning on my doorknob. Knocking even on my window now, the one just beside the door. I'm scared now, but I also know for sure that I don't know who it is, and I'm not opening that door. It also made me kind of mad. Like what? You're coming up on my sidewalk and banging out my door while I'm trying to play some Animal Crossing. So I go to the door and shout through it, demanding to know who's there. He calls back. Nikki, it's me, Ronald Simmons. I've got Eric's beer, let me in. Okay, my name's not Nikki. I don't even know a Nikki, let alone a Ronald Simmons. And Eric lives two more houses down. Clearly, he just has the wrong house, and this situation should be easily cleared up. I don't know who you are. I tell him to the door. You have the wrong house, you need to go. But he just bangs on the door some more, insists that he doesn't have the wrong house. Come on, Nicky, stop messing around and just open the door. It's me, Ronald Simmons. I have Eric's beer. He yells at me, tries the door again. Bangs on the window in an absolute frenzy. My name isn't Nikki. I yell back. You have the wrong house. You need to get out of here or I'm calling the cops. But he just keeps shouting and banging, calling me by the wrong name, begging me to just open the door. And he keeps repeating his name, his whole name, Ronald Simmons. It's me. It's Ronald Simmons. I have Eric's beer. Open the door. Just open the door. It's Ronald Simmons. We go back and forth for what feels like an eternity, but probably it was only 10 minutes or less. By this time, my kid had heard the commotion and is scared, and I'm not sure if he's going to escalate, but he definitely isn't listening to me, 
and he doesn't seem to be going away. I'm freaked out by how he keeps begging me to just open the door. Like maybe he doesn't have the wrong house at all and is just trying to get me to come outside. Tom has also come to mind, because he and Eric, they're friends, remember? So even though I don't want to, I call the cops. I tell Ronald Simmons that I've called the cops and everything goes quiet for a moment. I think maybe that that was enough to make him go away. I explain to the operator what's happening and they instantly dispatch someone. The operator asked if the man was still there, right as Ronald Simmons begins banging on the door and the windows again. Yeah, he's still here. I think he's confused but he won't leave. No, I don't know him. His name is Ronald Simmons. No, I don't know what he looks like. I can't see him. No, I'm not going to put my face in the window. He's still hitting the window on the door. You need me to look to get a description. God, okay. So I pull away the curtain and then lift away the heavy, difficult Venetian blinds. But it's pitch black and my porch light it doesn't work. All I can see is a bicycle ditched on my front sidewalk. I hear a woman shouting and it's difficult to make out. But it sounds like she's yelling at Ronald Simmons, telling him that he's got the wrong house. I think that it might be one of my immediate neighbors, but I'm not sure. Min doesn't stop him. He tells her to screw off and he keeps yelling at me. It feels like a lifetime passes, and the awareness that someone, some intruder is just a wall away is overwhelmingly surreal. I can hear him pacing up and down the sidewalk talking to me and himself. It feels like maybe he's searching for an entry point, but I can't tell for sure, all I can do is listen. I explain everything to the operator as it's happening, and it really doesn't take very long for the flashing lights to appear on my street. I hear officers calling out to Ronald Simmons, and then an exchange of dialogue, but I'm still not opening that door. It's hard to make out all the words, but I distinctively hear an officer say, so, why are you out here bothering this nice lady? Finally, somebody knocks and announces that he's one of the police officers. When I finally open the door, the said officer asks a few questions. Did he try to actually break into the house? I mean, no, but he kept trying my door like a maniac. He was looking for Eric's home down the street. Yeah, I know that. He wouldn't stop saying it. I tried to tell him that he had the wrong house. This is your bike. No. Okay, we'll make sure that he leaves with it. You have a nice night now. I have no idea what happened from there. No idea if they just took him to Eric's house or what. I saw him briefly standing in the headlights of the cop car on the road, talking to another officer. Skinny, hair buzzed so short as to be non-existent, clothes a little too big. I had never seen him before in my life. I assume that they didn't arrest him. I guess he really hadn't done anything criminal. But it still took hours for my heart to slow down and the adrenaline to wear off. I didn't sleep. I just waited for him to come back or for something else to happen. In the morning, my daughter and I went outside and found that one of our planter boxes on the porch had been demolished. It was kind of old anyway and probably just got stepped on in the scuffle. I left it alone because it felt weird to touch anything to do with Ronald Simmons. It took several more days for me to finally gather up the scraps and throw it away. It's been three full weeks and yesterday my daughter says, Mom, didn't we hide our spare key under that box? When I heard that, my soul left my body. She was right. Our old hiding spot had been really high, and it was very hard to access so the last time we had used it, I had just tucked it under that planter and forgot to move it again. But when I cleaned the box up, I never saw it. I checked these shrubs and soil nearby. I checked the entire small porch and stoop area. I checked and checked, but I couldn't find it anywhere. Now, maybe it had gotten thrown away with the box. Maybe it was just in the shrubs or the grass or something and I couldn't find it, maybe. But I changed the locks that day, just in case. To beat it all after a long, long period of nothing. I was going out to my car one day this week and heard a loud, low wolf whistle. It's Tom, waving at me from up the street. I pretend that I don't see him and I get in my car. 
There's some other unsettling things going on that are kind of their own story. Like the teenage kid who lives behind me who keeps throwing random toys and household items into my yard from a second story apartment window. There's also the two times this past month that I have been woken up by what I'm fairly certain was someone tapping on my bedroom window and the small dark hours of the morning. But Ronald Simmons really messed me up and has left me in a constant state of vigilance. Living basically alone lends a certain amount of nighttime paranoia. But now, I'm always wildly fluctuating between the 30 and 99% certain that someone is in my house, or just outside of my window, or both. And it doesn't help that it seems like Tom, who still lives just down the street, might possibly have some involvement. Or maybe Ronald Simmons was just some random drunk dude and I'm blowing everything out of proportion. Either way, for the love of God, Ronald Simmons and Tom from down the street, let's not meet again. This happened one year and two days ago. It was the day I never expected to come. It changed my life in so many ways that I still feel like I cannot digest it. I want to start saying a little bit about myself, so you understand the context and why it was so weird and foreign for something like this to happen to me. I'm a fairly geeky guy. I love science fiction and video games. I worked at the time as a design engineer in a factory, and spent most of my weekends with friends, hiking, playing board games, or watching movies. So you realize nothing I did would attract the attention of the cartels. I do not have a lot of money. I just live a lower, middle class type of life here in Mexico. But the real issue was my sister, who was a high ranking position in the public security area of politics. That's the reason I was targeted. It was an early Tuesday morning. I was on my way to work which started at 6am. I remember that day that I took my dad's SUV. I have a small sedan because they were away on vacation and I was supposed to pick them up at the airport after work that day. I lived about half an hour away from my work, so I left at about 5.25am every morning. 